I'll call the Board of Selectmen. Call the Board of Selectmen regular meeting of December 1st, 2021 to order. We've had the Pledge of Allegiance already this evening at our town meeting. Are there any additional agenda or consent items this evening? No. So we'll go to delegations. This will be the chance for any public who are here this evening to speak to the Board of Selectmen on, um, on anything that might be on your mind. I know there's a few people here tonight. When you do come up, you identify yourself, your name and your, um, and your address in town, if you do live in town, or if not, your affiliation of why you're here. Um, and um, we generally limit uh, delegations to three minutes. We can stretch it to five, but please be courteous to, to, to other members of the, the audience and, and uh, uh, give everybody a chance to speak. So who would like to go first? Anyone? Michelle? Hi all, uh, thank you for your time. Michelle Williams to Barrett Drive. Uh, I am here tonight to address the board and ask that the town not opt out of the state legislation requiring municipalities to allow accessory dwelling units. Just to clarify, um, I know all of you know this, but for the benefit of everyone, of everyone in the room, um, I'm a current member of the Planning Commission and chair of the Plan of Conservation and Development Subcommittee. And so I wanted to use this opportunity to draw your attention to some of the research and recommendations in the document specifically related to this issue. But I also want to be clear that this is not an issue that has come before the Planning Commission and nor will it. Um, so I'm speaking as a resident who is familiar with the document. Um, so um, I wrote some notes to make sure that I quote the document correctly. And I just want to call your attention first to the most direct part, uh, which is chapter seven on residential development and recommendation eight, which directly states, allow the construction of accessory apartments attached or detached on single family lots to diversify housing offering without contributing to sprawl or reducing space available for commercial use, provided it does not change or compromise existing neighborhood character. So that is the clear recommendation in the plan, which is to allow the ADUs. But I think what's most important is the background research. How did we come to this recommendation? Um, what went into putting it into the document? So um, many people who you have spoken to about this, what's out a lot in the research, uh, uh, will address uh, the need for affordable housing units, right? And while ADUs could be deeded to be affordable, uh, I wanted to also point out uh, that their size, as outlined in the legislation, and their location out at someone else's single family home, indicate that market rates will also fill a gap in affordable units, even if not deeded as such. Page 57 of the POCD discusses East Lyme's current and projected population mix. Currently, a quarter of our population is 65 and up, and that number is expected to increase to over 31% by the year 2025. Not only do ADUs help younger people obtain affordable housing, they can also help our aging population of homeowners stay in their homes by supplementing a fixed income. And I feel the need to note here that it's only if they want to. <laughs> um, they're not, nobody's gonna just be having someone move into their home. Uh, the third point that I wanted to draw out in the document is that currently apartments in East Lyme are often constructed as big box, dense uh, style units, and I'm not here to speak out against those types of development, but they're permitted only in commercial zones. And I know that you're all well aware that our town's commercial zones make up less than 5% of the total zoned space in town, space that's critical to be used, uh, to be available for commercial uses. Um, as it's also cited in the document through research by the American Farmland Trust, despite common misconception, residentially developed space does not equate to more tax revenue as the revenue generated is often offset by the cost of services and therefore a town needs to balance out resident residential development with commercial development, farm, and open space to cover the deficit from residential use. Our community questionnaire which was conducted in our research to update the plan of conservation and development was very clear. East Limers enjoy the residential nature of our town. Therefore, it's critical that we use existing commercial space for commercial uses 
and ADUs allow us to add apartments to our housing inventory without taking up large tracts of commercial space. The community survey conducted um, was also clear on residents' desire to limit sprawl and protect natural resources. We heard earlier in the town meeting about the desire to protect our water sources. ADUs allow us to increase housing in low impact ways. In some cases, it could be without creating additional impervious surfaces at all. But in all cases, it allows us to add apartments without clear cutting large tracts of land. And finally, the document addresses in a separate section on agricultural development, the need to support agricultural lands in East Lyme and suggest expanding ways in which farmers can make their land more financially sustainable. ADUs are certainly an avenue toward that on a farm. So I hope that you'll consider this research and the thought out recommendations in the POCD as you deliberate your decision tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Anyone else? Anyone else? Jason? Hi everyone, I'm Jason Diebel. I live at 5 McKinnon Place here in East Lyme. Um, and I know this is the final meeting for some of you, so thank you very much for your service and for giving me an opportunity to speak. I would like to start by saying congratulations. Um, it's not every day that people get an opportunity such as what you guys have here tonight. The past few years have been an eye-opening experience for communities all across America. Many of us who thought we had stamped out the scourge of racism and created communities that were just, equitable, and fair realized that systemic racism is a very real thing with very real consequences and very deep roots. But all any of us could really do is wring our hands in worry. I mean, what else could we do? What can ordinary citizens do? We don't have the, the power needed to really do the difficult work to undo systemic racism. We don't get that sort of opportunity. But you, here tonight, on the Board of Selectmen, have that opportunity. Some of you, for the final time this evening, are vested with the power that is required to undo this sort of historical systemic racism. Uh, you have the opportunity to give East Lyme a tool to help bridge the wealth gap and to help make East Lyme more reflective of Connecticut in general. It's a marvelous opportunity to strike at the heart of systemic racism. That's something very rare and very special. And you don't have to wring your hands and worry like us. You can actually affect change, real change. Of course, I'm speaking in favor of ADUs tonight, and I just wanted to address that some of us among some of us here might um, use the ideas of ADUs to kind of stoke fear, warning us that if we permit them, the town could be town population could double overnight. Um, if this were true, it would only happen because every single person in town wanted an ADU on their property. If this were to come to pass, it would only be because. Uh, every single resident could invest the s considerable resources to putting an ADU on their property. And it also would only happen if um, ADUs were filled with thousands and thousands of families that were trying to move to East Lyme and wanted to do so so badly that they would do so in the dead of night. Um, so I seriously doubt our population will double overnight. I see this as a uh, little more than kind of a fanciful fever dream. And if we're going to be honest with each other, this is not about Airbnbs or summer rentals or flop houses. These are real people trying to build lives in a community of their choice. Is East Lyme so attractive that 19,000 people are clamoring to come here tomorrow? Are there 19,000 people living here right now that want to set up these ADUs? If either of these things are true, why hadn't we done something about it already? If 38,000 people want to enter this sort of arrangement, could it possibly be that bad? And who are we to stand in their way? The recent headlines in the paper have revealed that racism and violence and hurt are still very real and very present in our community, for better or for worse. And 
It's a tangled, multifaceted, intergenerational problem that will not be solved with a single vote here tonight. So I don't want to overstate the importance of your opportunity. However, I do want you to understand that you have a rare moment right now to make real change. And I hope that I, I hope you uh, take a moment to consider the weight of that responsibility. You have what we all want. You have an opportunity to push back against systemic racism. It's something we all want in this nation, but only you, lucky few, get a chance to really do it. So I want to congratulate you on having such an awesome and enviable opportunity here tonight. And I want to thank you again for your service to the town. That's all. Thank you, Jason. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Nope. I got one. And then I see you, Holly. Um, my name is Christine Stahl. I live at 41 Aswagachi Hills Road, Niantic. I actually thought uh, Michelle did such a stupendous job of articulating all the things that I wanted to say that I could just sit back. But I also think that it's important that you just see some more faces because I think if we could, you know, knock doors and take a poll, most people would say yes, this is this is something that is good for our community. But we also know that most people are not engaged in town politics. It's certainly not to the level that we would like them to be. And not for any other reason than, you know, life is busy and, and it's just one of those things that kind of falls off our plate. So, so I don't know if I'll say anything better than what Michelle said, and I, I like what Jason said as well, but just to add a little bit that, well, you know what, I'm sorry, I'm going to just take this off so I don't fog up. Um, so we have a lack of residential yearly rental housing options in East Lyme. Uh, I work in real estate and often get calls from people searching for rentals across the state. Yesterday, a search for year-round single-family rentals in East Lyme came up with just three results. This included one bedroom under 600 square feet for $2,000 a month, and then two four-bedrooms. One was 1,500 square feet for $2,500 a month, and the other was 2,200 square feet for $2,800 a month. According to the most recent data from Zillow, the average rent in Connecticut for 2020 was about $1,800. East Lyme is well above the average of our state. And compared to the national average, Connecticut rent costs over 9% more. The passage of HB 6107, legalizing accessory apartments in Connecticut, is an opportunity for homeowners, renters, and the town. For homeowners, accessory dwelling units can increase property value and create supplemental income. And I would just ask that you consider for a moment um, a homeowner who uses an accessory apartment to house their aging parents. This would be someone like myself, housing my aging parents. But then I would in turn be able to use that in the future to rent out additional space to supplement my income as I start to plan for retirement. Um, this is, I think this is the type of thing that we're going to see. That's, that's really the kind of scenario that we're looking at. Um, I would also that add that as someone who lived in an accessory apartment after college, that I appreciate its unique ability to provide both a small affordable option for housing in an otherwise cost prohibitive town while also providing supplemental income for the homeowner. East Lamb is a wonderful town and we should be welcoming. We should want people to come here. We should want our kids to come back here. They can't necessarily afford that and I don't necessarily want them in my basement. So I think that this is something that we should think about for young, for old, um, for people who are moving to our town, who love our schools and would like to eventually buy a house here, but want to at least get into the school district, you know, so they'll maybe they have a small family. They're, they'll start off and, and uh, you know, have, have residents in an accessory unit while they save or search and then and buy a home and then they don't have to switch their kids to different districts. If you've ever moved around, you would appreciate that. And I, and I don't know your own circumstances, but um, education and my job and my husband's job has moved us such that our kids are living now in their third state and in their fourth home uh, and they're 15 and 17. So sometimes those things happen and for continuity, even just of education, it's nice for families to have opportunities for you know various living situations, and I think that this is um, something that an ADU could could help with. Um, so anyway, um, I just ask that you, uh, the town of East Lyme, just consider this very carefully um, and not give in to fear or you know some of the rhetoric that's out there, and just uh, consider this as, as a huge opportunity for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Anyone? Oh, Holly, I I recognized you, Holly. If you're willing to get up or. 
if anybody else would like to, I'll make you the final. Oh, oh, Anne. Come on I am up. on zoning. So yes, can I speak to you are, because you're a citizen of this town. You do not speak <laughs> on behalf of the zoning commission, or you don't use their words. You use your own words. Yes, I'm Anne Thurlow, 80 Smith Street, Niantic. I'm here to um, talk about the accessory apartments. I think we should opt out, and I think we should do it now and not wait. Um, because of the way the bill's written, the town cannot impose stricter regulations than what is in the bill. So it can't be contained to certain zones in town. It means any single family house can build an accessory. Um, you have to think about people that live in sparser areas on purpose because they want more yard, they want privacy. They could wake up and have an apartment on each side of their backyard and lose all that privacy. Um, I think denser areas, if you do this, you're going to have a lot more cars. You'll have, you can have parking issues. Um, one of the big things to me that's an issue with it is you can't regulate the architecture. You cannot mandate that it, the architecture goes with the house that's building it. Um, for that matter, shipping containers are considered structures and people are refurbishing those now as, as houses. If someone has the right setbacks, they could put one in their front yard. I mean, there's no, we cannot mandate that it look like the house. Um, we can't mandate that it has to be in the backyard. If someone has a huge front yard and it meets the setbacks, it could go in the front yard. Um, we can't mandate that the owner of the property live in one of the structures. And to me, if you have an out-of-town owner that has a rental and they can squeeze another rental on the lot, you know, the odds that it's going to be kept up are not great. Um, you know, there's an argument out there that, oh, it increases property values. Well, if you're building one, it may increase your property value by 25% if you do it well, but for your neighbors, if you don't, it would decrease their property value. So I think you have to think of um, your neighbor. I mean, there are several reasons like this. I think the way the law is written is a bad idea. I think it's better if the town zoning comes up with their own zoning recommendations. Um, I think the town is working to get affordable housing. The new Rocky Neck development, I know rent start, I know people paying 800 a month there for the market value is 2200 We're building affordable housing on Bridebrook Road, which is a residential area. Um, I've heard the argument, wait a year and experiment. Well, you know, ideally that sounds good unless the experiment is next to your house and doesn't turn out very well. Um, just visually, I'm a visual person. I just see visual chaos happening because you can't regulate this law. And I really think we should come up with our own ideas instead of um, buying into this. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, Ann. There's nobody else. So, um, Madam uh, uh, State State Rep, yeah. if you'd like to come on up, uh, Mrs. Cheeseman. Thank you, Holly Cheeseman, 16 Mitchell Drive, Niantic, also the state representative. Well, I'll address the affordable um, accessory dwelling units first. I did have a number of other things to report on tonight. Um, I was in Hartford when HB 1607 was voted on, and I think um, Ms. Thurlow raised many good points about these accessory dwelling units. To be honest, if we are going to allow this, why do we even bother to have a local zoning commission? If we're going to allow Hartford to dictate everything we do with our land use, why do we have a planning commission? Why do we have a POCD? Let us just let people in Hartford tell us how we should develop our town. No one would argue with the need to allow our seniors, our children, to live in the town that they grew up in, where they raised their children, and we are making great strides in allowing that to happen. But to say, by right, everyone who owns a single family home can, in effect, bypass our zoning regulations and have this accessory dwelling unit in their yard, I think ignores reality. 
ignores what's really in the best interests of this town. If I could believe that by allowing this, we would permit and make affordable housing for everyone who wanted to live in East Lyme, I would be absolutely in support. But I don't see this as the way forward. Our 830G statute at the state level has never really been modernized. The fact that a place you can rent exceeds a certain age and all of a sudden becomes unaffordable, quote unquote, that's crazy. If we're really serious about allowing everyone who lives in East Lyme to have the chance to live here, let's let the town work with our developers, let's let the town work with our citizens, and have us make the choice about how best to move forward. So I would urge this board to exercise the authority the voters have given them and make the best decisions for everyone in the town. The other issues I wanted to address tonight were with regard to our departing first selectman and the other members of the Board of Selectmen, Mark Salerno and Paul Daigle. I want to thank you for your service. I know you devote so many hours to serving this town in a selfless manner really trying to represent the best interests, trying to act in a bipartisan manner, losing so many hours that you could have spent with your family and your children. And for that, I thank you. I know it's hard, but I appreciate your service. With regard to what we're doing in Hartford, I know in the short session, February 9th through May 5th, I think, one of the big issues we are going to be addressing is the mental health of our children. We've seen so much suffering during the pandemic, but in many ways, as tragic as the loss of life has been, the price paid by our children has been huge. Our pediatricians, our mental health professionals cannot keep up with the demand for the services our children are requiring. We've seen their school life disrupted, we've seen their home life disrupted, and I know that's gonna be a huge priority going forward. For the first time in decades, Connecticut actually has a ton of money. So one of the discussions is going to be, and a lot of that has been courtesy of the federal government who, unlike the state of Connecticut, can print money like crazy. But there are significant funds that have not only been put in the budget, but also funds coming in from sales tax, from withholding, that put us in a $915 million surplus in the next fiscal year. I have been arguing, as have some of my colleagues, for some of that money to be returned to our residents whether in the shape of restoring that property tax credit of $500. I've been advocating for helping to fill the hole in our unemployment insurance trust fund, which would help our small businesses, and returning money to the towns so they can devote it to their services that will make our lives better. So again, I would urge you to opt out of the accessory dwelling unit. I think we need to look at what's in the best interest of our town and help those residents who want to build these accessory dwelling units going forward, but not give a blanket carte blanche. I want to thank you all for your service. And I want everyone to know that it's, as always, an honor to represent you. And please never hesitate to contact me if there's anything I or our wonderful Senator Paul Formica can do for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Holly, and, and uh, thank you for your nice words. Thank you for your service, um, tireless service over the years, and your continued service. Anyone else? Um, okay. Steve, Steve, I'm going to let you go right after, okay? Yes, um, help me again. So I just, um, I guess, uh, aside from the ADUs, since we can talk about other things, 
Um, I just want to post to this board or the next group, whoever comes in next. I heard um, Representative Cheeseman talking about our children and their, so their social emotional needs and uh, all the things that they're going through right now. And I guess it just made me think of it. I just want to throw something out to you guys to maybe consider go going forward because um, I think it's probably too late to do anything about it now. We all know about the horrific school shooting that took place in Michigan. Um, and we know about the, uh, the toll that gun violence is taking on our children. I spoke, I thought, as passionately or eloquently as I could at the zoning meeting regarding Viking firearms and um, training. And um, it pains me terribly to hear people like Representative Cheeseman get up and say that this is, a prob this is a problem that we all are worried about and we have money and blah, blah, blah. But I just, I don't think it, it's getting through in our town. I don't think that we're really coming to terms with this issue. Um, so, you know, you're the Board of Selectmen. <laughs> you're our next Selectmen. I hope that you guys will do better for our town. Um, I hope that you will consider things more deeply. The Zoning Committee didn't really consider the Viking um, issue with the firearms and training. Uh, they didn't consider it at all. They didn't reach out to pediatricians. We talked about reaching out to pediatricians. Um, that would have been great, or psychologists, or, or anybody. Um, so you're, you're the most powerful people in this town, and I just implore you to please, as we're all still spinning from the horrors that happened in Michigan, to do something, to do something for our town, so that five years from now, the 15-year-old, you know, that we saw that shot up his school in, in Ox at Oxford High School in Michigan, you know, isn't a, a Viking, you know, and wasn't a regular at a place like Viking Farms and, tra and Training. I, I hope that you guys consider this, this uh, seriously and, and deeply, because you never know, you know, you never know what can happen to your town. So I just figured, what the heck, I'm here. I have the opportunity to talk to you without being, you know, blocked from your Facebook pages. So uh, please, 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 for the sake of our children, for the sake of our town, if we can't get it right on ADUs, can we get it right on, on gun violence in our children? That would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, we do not, uh, we don't have the ability to, uns uh, to overrule a zoning commission. This is an exception to this particular legislation, the way it was written. But zoning is zoning. They have their responsibilities. We as selectmen have ours. Um, and they, when they go through their zoning, You're kind of responsible. it's okay. I'll do that. Okay. Um, uh, we, um, sorry, now you got me off. Um, they, they must consider certain things, but they can't consider other things. Uh, zoning rules and zoning regulations are land use based. And if it's allowed by law, it's allowed in certain zones and that's how that works so if, if if we could consider it we may we may have had that opportunity we do not have that by law Steve you had raised your hand and ask you to come on up good, e <clears throat> good evening uh, Steve Larson uh, 47 Oswagachi Hills Road um, and I think that this kind of conversation is healthy for the town um, and I think we need more of these kind of conversations, not less. Um, I would urge you not to opt out, and I'm going to go through a couple of the reasons. I think that um, one of my biggest concerns, the only two people that spoke tonight in opposition, we had no one speak in opposition at the public hearing at the zoning board. Eight people spoke in favor of the accessory units, and, and no one spoke in opposition. I think someone made a comment earlier tonight, if we were to poll the town, uh, if we were to have a referendum on this, there's probably not a statutory way to do this, but if there was a statutory way for the town to call a referendum on this question, I think it would be a very interesting outcome and would inform this democratic process. Because I think the majority of residents would support the accessory units. I think it's interesting, um, uh, Ann speaks about and others spoke about, let the town solve this problem. I think Holly used the same expression. Let the town solve the problem itself. The town hasn't solved this problem. In fact, the town's taken steps to keep people out as far as accessory units were concerned. If the town had an accessory unit provision, there might not be a reason to change it. But none of the leaders that have been involved in the process have been able or willing to really make the changes that are necessary. I looked at the reasons that the Zoning Commission gave 
because one of the statutory requirements, of course, is that you have to give what your reasons are. Now, this group doesn't have to do that, so you, you're able to do it without having any good reason. But the reasons that the Zoning Commission gave was it's contradictory to our responsibility that we are charged with preserving property values. Well, I don't know that anyone has introduced any fact that this in, would if impact property values in a negative way. In fact, most of the science shows that it increases property values when you add uh, accessory units. I think there are four states in the country right now that have accessory units, uh, Vermont, uh, New York, uh, Oregon and California, and there's no evidence that those accessory units have reduced property values. So uh, property values gets everybody agitated, you know, people talk about container ships and all that kind of stuff, gets everybody agitated, but that's all myth. Look at the facts, look at the evidence. So there's no evidence that it affects uh, the property values. It gives us very little control over this type of development. Well, if you read the statute, it actually gives the town quite a bit of control because the town can enforce all, all of its zoning regulations as it applies to setbacks and environment and all those uh, types of type, heights of buildings. Anything that's in the current zoning regulations that would affect development can be applied, uh, be applied to this. And the statute is also permissive around establishing design standards as long as they're uniformly applied. So we can't just apply it to this one here. We'd have to have them apply townwide. And I think there's going to be a commission, I think, established by the legislature to develop those design standards during the coming year. And the last reason is it's too general and it's inappropriate for the town. I don't know what that means. I don't know why it's inappropriate. I don't know why it's too general. Um, but in any event, these reasons I don't think will really stand the test of time and they don't stand the test of the facts uh, in this, in this uh, situation. I'm going to urge you to do the same thing I urge the Zoning Commission to do. Um, if you take no action or do not approve this uh, opt-out, the statute takes effect in January. The Zoning Commission will still have to adopt regulations to, to implement this. There's no Airbnb. I, thought, I saw something in your minutes. I think, Mark, you made this comment that this was going to increase Airbnb. The, the town can actually prevent short-term rentals in, in, this, in this type of situation. So there's really no risk there. Go ahead and do it. You have until January of 23. There will be some new faces up here. There may even be some new faces on the Zoning Commission. You know, we have until January 1 of 23 to opt out. And we could use this year empirically to gather our own evidence as to whether this works in this town or not. So I would urge you to not opt out tonight, to use this year to encourage the new Zoning Commission to adopt regulations, to see what the design standards are that are developed by the legislative, uh, the legislative committee. It's not a legislative committee, it's a committee that's authorized by the legislation. And, and, and give us a chance to see whether the fear that is generated really bears out in the reality. And I, uh, my last comment is, and there were some comments made earlier tonight, and I think uh, from the plan, plan of conservation development from Michelle, which was really quite well done. Th this is consistent with our POCD, as she, as she pointed out. And uh, I will end. Yeah, I did. Let you know you're at five. Okay, thank you. That wasn't a stop feed. Okay, all right. Yeah, I'm used to appearing before at Polly, and they, they do stop you <laughs> sometimes. But anyway, um, I, I kind of lost my, my, my train of Oh, the, the train of thought really was not only does this make it affordable for people to come in, because these are 1,000 feet or less. 1,000 feet or less. 30% of the size of your home. You have a 2,000 square foot home, it's 600 square feet. These are not families of 10, <laughs> okay? Uh, and it's uh, not only a way for young people to get a, a toe in the town, it's a way for our elderly to afford the property taxes in this town and have some income to pay uh, their taxes. So I would urge you to give this a shot. Thank you very much. Like, um, yes, ma'am, you want to come up since you're on your way, and then I'll, then I'll have you come up. Pardon me. I'm sorry to be late, and pardon me if I repeat any points that have been made. Um, I'm not an ex expert in this whatsoever, but I learned that address? this was... Oh. Name and address? Oh, sorry. 
Michelle Maitland, um, 6 Acorn Drive. So I didn't, um, I learned that there were people opposed to this and that this might not be, that we might opt out and I was so surprised so I had to come up here, <laughs> state my opinion. So um, if accessory dwelling units are allowed in East Lyme without condition, they would further degrade stormwater and put added stress on already challenged sewer systems. Uh, that is why I don't support allowing their use unconditionally. Uh, to be clear, I'm a fan of the, adding this option to our housing stock. These small apartments are uniquely suited for supportive housing. It seems not just practical, but compassionate. Uh, consider our East Line families with developmentally disabled adults. Uh, we are rightfully proud of our miracle field. Allowing these units is another simple expression of humanity. They can, be, uh, they can allow for qualified independent living. Or they can be used as artist studios, uh, supporting a more creative community, which I think we could really use. They are flexible, and that is the point. Another point is that passage allows for regulation of surreptitious cases that may be happening already, uh, increasing community health and safety. Uh, yet the most important reason to say yes is the big picture of U.S. demographic data. In just nine years, projections are that the number of old, older adults uh, will increase by 18 million. That shift alone should make the choice easy. Families searching now for long-term care must weigh forced bankruptcy at one end of the scale and neglect and poor health outcomes on the opposite. There is already an ongoing shortage of caregivers. What do you imagine 18 million added elderly will do to that? Aging at home and accessory, accessory dwelling units are concepts that go hand in hand and promote healthier and happier elderly residents. Soon, that will be you and me, if we should be so lucky. Um, please take this opportunity tonight to add this sensible option to our community toolbox. I see no reason to delay. But by all means, craft the permitting such that infrastructure limitations and environmental impacts are taken into consideration. The town could require impervious area swaps, mandate no added sewer burdens, limit new units to nuclear family members, or use fee structures to guide needed results. Drafting these details does take work and time, but that is why we must start now. The future waits for no one. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Do you need the, the last name too? Oh, yeah. I think I'm yes. going to take this off. Okay. Person, yeah. Person Sorry. Name and address. Yeah, it's uh, Nick Menapace. That's M E N A P A C E. I live on 38 Hope Street. Um, I actually want to open up for that one, um, and I do forgive me, I did get here later than I intended, so I live at 38 Hope Street, the development over there, uh, my wife and I live there. I think that we are probably the youngest people that I see there by about like 30 years, and I will say when I go around town in downtown Niantic, I really like living in Niantic, it's great. I always have to say, I'm, I'm, bo I'm not born in Connecticut, but I've lived here most of my life, and I, I used to live up in the Hartford area. And one of the ones that always bugged me is that when I lived up there, I always saw that there was this thing of, that people could not get their heads around of just how expensive it is to live in our state. And I love living in Connecticut. I love the fall. I love the winter. I don't love the summer, but that's not related to that. That's just because I hate ticks. And it makes me so upset to see this very bare minimum law. And I will be honest with you guys, I pushed really hard, not necessarily here in, in Connecticut, of trying to get a better law than this passed. One that made affordable housing more of an option. One that did more than allow people to build accessory dwelling units within the zoning laws something that is not going to result in a lot of new affordable housing. It is certainly better than nothing. But to treat it as if this is a boogeyman coming in here is going to destroy our town with this tiny ability to, in a limited number of houses, build an accessory dwelling unit is kind of unfathomable to me. I made a joke in here that we, that, I don't have that one, but 
I can't imagine a law, and I, I was very disappointed to hear Representative Cheeseman. I do really love seeing you come to the meeting for this one, but I was so disappointed to hear it because she knows that better laws were proposed. Where I live in the Hosea, we have some of the subsidized housing over there. It's only available for older people, which is great, and I love seeing that it's available for them. It is not available for everyone. I work as a teacher. My wife is an engineer. We can't really afford to not live in a condo and live in this town. It is just not something that's very practical for us. I saw in Zillow before I was checking it before coming that there's like a, a one that's under 200,000. It's about 500 square feet, which I think is about the size of the first apartment I had when I lived up in Vernon. But I also don't really know the zoning thing, so I could be completely off on that one. Um, it certainly was a small apartment. So I do not understand where we have these brand new big developments in town of people building houses out in here and we have all this new stuff and the idea of like sewage oh it's going to be a problem if we build this small apartment on this lot that that'll 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 push us over the edge and i just hate this mentality of not in our backyard can't allow those people to come in here we can do it somewhere else and like i said in fairness i would much prefer to see a better law than this. Something that allows affordable access so people can enjoy that the town we live in, and it's not determined by how much money is in your bank necessarily. I think that makes for a much better community. I think it makes for a much diverse community, which we all know is going to make our community better. I think it would make for a better state because it is hard to live in this state with how much it costs. I had it a couple years ago that I found, I did was able to find a place to live, which was, I think it was two bedrooms up in Vernon, Connecticut, and that was around 1200 a month, which I thought was very cheap. It's not $1,200 a month anymore. And that was, what, six, seven years ago? So that's gone up. That was the, I could drag down this. I can't, I don't think I could find a place for 1200 a month for a lot of this to be able to live here in Niantic. And maybe that's the way some of you guys like it, that... Yeah, we don't want people living here if they can't afford to pay it. I don't think that's what this community is about. And like I said, the idea that the accessory dwelling units are going to be our undoing, I cannot imagine that that many are even going to be looked at. And as Steve had very well said in this here, let's see here. You guys have a law that you can opt out of. And if I recall, um, I don't mean about it, but the, the town lawyer, I believe, is that one. Are we not still not able to make a law that would be harsher than this? So you can't implement a law that's going to be like, well, you can't, you can either just not allow any of them, or you can't make it, well, we have to follow this zoning law, because this law allows you to do that. You can do, like, make the own laws about this one, and it's not a problem. There is almost no consequence to it. If you just allow these to be built, I don't honestly think you're going to have that many of them. I would love it if you do, but you're not. The idea that this is some kind, I'm sorry, I know I'm repeating myself on this one, but it, the idea that this is some kind of a boogeyman, that, oh, the big bad accessory dwelling units are coming, it's just silly. Like, we're all smarter than that. We know that, that that's not going to happen. We don't need to be afraid of something as small as this. It should have been approved. It's like, well, you don't even do approve. You're right. It's not like an approved thing. You just don't opt out of it. And that's it. That's all that would happen. You'd get a couple of permits for accessory dwelling units, and then you'd move on. And I do apologize, because I, I did miss the boot. So if there was some no, new information, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. that happened that I'm sorry if I wasn't aware of it. But thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Come on up, Steve. Uh, mine's a question. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with whether or not a public notice was posted after the Zoning Commission action. I couldn't find it in the paper, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That is a requirement, and uh, the 15 days have elapsed. I don't understand what he was asking. He's asking if they had to publish or not Who? their decision. Uh, zoning. zoning. If they had to. Or oh, the law just is, is very specific. They 
can opt out or do they not and do they have to publish and that would be something for the attorneys to answer at some point. Any other public comment? We'll go on to our agenda then. The approval of the minutes of the public hearing uh, of October 20th, 2021. Move to approve the public hearing meeting minutes of October 20th, 20, 2021. Second. It's been seconded. Any further comment? Any corrections? Yes. Yes, ma'am. I can find that. I'm so busy. Well, we'll slow thing. down. Absolutely. <laughs> Take your time and find it. And it's 1D. Wait a minute. Um, <clears throat> this is for the special meeting? This is the um, public hearing minutes of October 20th. I, I don't yeah, know that that was special. Just hang on a second. Some it would have been comments. special. It would have been a regular meeting. Um, okay. The regular meeting of October 20th? No, we aren't um, here yet. We're on the yeah, we're, gonna, we're at the public, public hearing. hearing. About it. I'm back there. I'm set. <laughs> Is there any other correction? And any correction? If not, I'll call them the, the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? All right. We're going to go to the regular meeting of October 20th. Okay, I'm there now. I'll move to approve the regular meeting minutes of October 20th, 2021, as submitted. Second. We have a motion and seconded. And Mrs. Hardy? Okay, on um, page four, number seven, public comment. Um, the comment from uh, Ms. Alberti. Um, Say the board of selectmen did not address the issue of using the twelve thousand five hundred purchase punch pump, uh, the pump out boat, uh, which was a violation of the use as a municipality that you cannot use federal funds to offset a federal grant. Is this addressed someplace later on? I didn't find any uh, response to that, but I think at some point we did. There was uh, explanation of that. I believe later in the meeting, it's the first election state that, that was a mistake. Uh, it wasn't done. Uh, I, I have it on the top of page five in response to Ms. Alberti's comments regarding the use of ARP funds for okay. the pump out boat. All right, I do see it now. Yes. Thank you. That's all that I have for yeah. It wasn't our mistake, it was theirs, to be clear. Mm -hmm. um, the Save the River, Save the Hills group. Um, we're following their request. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that our minutes address that. All right. And that's appreciated. Is, are there any other comments, corrections, questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Any abstain? And then there was November. November 3rd, 2021. I'll move to approve the regular meeting minutes of November 3rd, 2021. Second. Any comments, corrections? Yes. Yeah. Page two. About a third of the way down the page, mm. uh, the sentence, uh, the first line says allowed. Allowed is the end of this sentence, but it's the first of the next in the line. Um, oh, okay. Mr. Nickerson inquired if the board's decision could be reserved either way. I think that it's supposed to be I don't think it's supposed to be reserved. I think it's supposed to be reversed. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Okay. Um, yeah, no kidding. Okay, so then if we come down about uh, four sentences, the line begins with C, S, E, E. Yep. Uh, Attorney Zamarka stated that the act does not speak to that one way or the other, and he does not see why they could not reverse the decision. Right. So I think that that reflects back that the first one should have been right. reversed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me see. About five lines. Below that, the first word is zoning regulations. Mm -hmm. All right, so if we go back, the next line start. Attorney Zamaka responded that current research says that a town cannot limit the location of such units. All existing zoning regulations, such as setbacks, must be followed. 
I believe that that I think that that is that's correct. But I wanted to call it to attention tonight because I think that this uh, plays on our uh, decision making this evening. Um, uh, thank you. There's no correction there, just to be right. clear, correct? Right. Okay. And uh, then let me see. Okay, I think uh, I think that that's it. Motions on the table for the 3rd of November, regular minutes. There was one correction. We're done um, with the correction. And we've um, amended the approval to include the reverse versus reserved. And I assume, I think you, you seconded that, and that's okay with you as well. So we're clear uh, that we're voting on these minutes with one correction. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay, and then I'll move to approve the regular meeting minutes moment. of November 17th, 2021. Second. Mrs. Hardy? There were no minutes. Oh, yes, there were. Yep, there. It was just that special meeting. <laughs> that was a quick one. The real quick one. Yep. Right. Are there any corrections or questions or comments? If not, this is not a regular <laughs> meeting. This is a special yeah, yeah, meeting. Special meeting minutes. Uh, the agenda does say regular but the um the our thing. minutes do correctly say yeah, special, say special. for the record all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed aye. any abstain there is a consent calendar this evening i'll move to approve, move to approve the consent calendar for the meeting of december 1st 2021 the amount of thirty three thousand five hundred and fifty eight dollars and seventy six cents second Motions are made and seconded. Any comments? Yes, I'd like some clarification, please, on the um, item on the consent so calendar much. about uh, three quarters of the way down. East Lime Water and Sewer, uh, state overpayment on property balance, and there was a refund of $28,000. Uh, could we have some explanation of what that was about? Yes, uh, Mrs. Johnson's here this evening, our finance director. You'll come to the podium as well. Is that, was that that um, payment for the Starlight? Yes, that's correct. So um, yeah. when the payment came to the town, a portion of it was intended for the tax department, and the remaining portion was for water and sewer um, bills that had not been paid. The check went to the tax collector, and the tax collector, um, uh, like, applied it all to um, tax liabilities. So um, when it got sorted out and it was determined that that portion belonged to water and sewer, that's the reason for the refund. We did not give it back to the state. Correct. Let's be clear on that. No, it's going to, okay. water, it and to water and sewer. Yeah. Right. Okay, so the money was, I, I, could you just go this, through that again? So basically the state, instead of writing one check specifically to um, cover the taxes and one to cover the water and sewer bills, the state wrote one check. The check went to the tax collector and the tax collector applied it all to taxes when a portion of it was um, for water and sewer. All right, thank you. Yep. I question that because I don't recall ever seeing something like this on the consent calendar before. Yeah, it, it could catch on that. I it do do understand that the reason why John McCullough applied the entire amount to the taxes owed because there were more taxes owed than there was paid for by the state, but the state does reserve that ability and right, I guess, not to pay the full um, bill uh, taxes do. Oh, um, they won't pay pen penalties and interest, I believe. Um, they, but they did pay a fair portion. I don't believe they paid penalties and interest. I think that's what the, the kicker was on that. So some of that money did go over to water and sewer, which was also an owed bill for that property that has been taken by eminent domain or purchased. I don't know if it was eminent. I guess it wasn't eminent domain. They purchased it for the expansion of the highway. So That'd be they the owe tax on that property, which they are not going to pay? Do, Ed, do you want to, you're, you have vast knowledge on this. Maybe you can uh, fill us in, because it is interesting. When the uh, uh, state took the motel property by eminent domain, uh, the town made a claim against the money that the state deposited with the uh, New London Superior Court uh, as, a, as 
as a creditor of the motel because the motel owned a certain amount, owed a certain amount of property for real estate taxes and also for water and sewer, ta uh, water and sewer bills. And it owed a certain amount of property for the existing motel that was in operation. And also that standalone building, which is in front of the motel, which has not been used for uh, many years, it still generates a uh, minimum water bill every six months. It was hard to suss that out, but now I know what it, what it is. And uh, we filed in the Superior Court uh, a claim that the town owed, was owed a certain amount of money on the date of the take. And that is the amount of money that we're entitled to. Uh, Mr. McCullough still has his uh, machines operating after the date of the take, uh, uh, that, that a certain amount of money is owed every month after the date of the take. And uh, when he got that check, uh, for he just applied it to all the money that was owed according to his calculator calculating machines. <laughs> but the amount of money that is owed stops on the date of the take. So that is why that, that uh, amount uh, stopped. It was a different amount. Yes. Now, as, as uh, a, a sideline, the state does owe and does pay to the town uh, the water and sewer bills because the state had to find itself, it found itself operating that place for a number of uh, months after it was taken until the tenants moved out, and I think they have moved out by this we're, time. We're hoping to, to keep them out at this point. Yeah. 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 So um, Thank you, they paid rent. The, the water and sewer bills uh, continue to, to be generated, yeah. and the state has paid those after the date of the take. Thank you. You do all know that when Ed says uh, John McCullough's machines, he's referring to the computers in John's office. <laughs> that, <laughs> <laughs> that it calls machines. <laughs> Calculating machines. Uh, we have a motion on the table. Any other questions or concerns? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? All right, we'll go back to our agenda and open up uh, uh, the old business. We, we had a, a fairly uh, decent um, conversation about the um, accessory dwelling units at our last meeting um, after zoning. Um, voted to opt out of the program. Uh, Mr. Zamarka, do you want to update us or do you want to just be here for questions? Um, Chair's, Chair's pleasure. Yeah, well, why don't you remind us of the process? I, I, the, short, the short version of that, which is zoning, zoning did have their public hearing and they went through the, the land use part of um, how this affects zoning regulations, et cetera. That's, that's correct. Uh, PA 2129 does allow a town to opt out of the accessory dwelling unit provisions, uh, provided they follow a two-step process. As you noted, Mr. Chairman, the first step was with the Zoning Commission. They held a properly noticed public hearing. They affirmatively decided to opt out by a two-thirds vote. Uh, they stated their reasons on the record, and notice was published uh, in the newspaper. Um, the Act then provides that thereafter, and I'm reading directly from it, the, legis the municipality's legislative body or a municipality where the legislative body is a town meeting, its board of selectmen, by a two-thirds vote may complete the process by which a mun such municipality opts out of the provisions of PA 2129 as regards the accessory dwelling units. Uh, in October, the Zoning Commission voted uh, four to two to opt out and to recommend uh, that the Board of Selectmen uh, take it up under consideration at their next meeting, which happened last time. Uh, we discussed it, and we are here now. And we're still here. Great, thank you. Um, well, uh, are there any questions? Yeah, yes, while, while sure you're there, Mark. While you're, while you're up there. Sure. Um, so we have until 23 to make the final decision to opt out. That's correct. But if we wait until 23, then immediately these 
uh, accessory units would be allowed. January. As of January 1, 22. Right. So then, uh, even though we wait, to, even though we thought we might wait until 23, the process would begin and be ongoing. It, yes, until, that's until that's that's correct. Time. That's correct. And uh, if we opt out now, we cannot opt back. We cannot decide to opt back in. Well, that, we're not entirely certain of that. We're not entirely. There's there's no provision in the act one way or another mm -hmm. that addresses that. It's the best we can say at this point. Okay. Well, the reason for my question is that um, attorney. Uh, I don't mean attorney. Uh, Representative Cheeseman has stated that she thinks there are going to be further amendments to this bill, further updates in the next session, uh, which might change or address some of the issues that uh, are in this bill. So if we opted out now, we don't know whether we could, if we made the decision to opt back in by 23, could we do that? That's something we'd have to look into, to be honest with you, Ms. Hardy. Um, in fact, I was at CCM conference yesterday and went to a seminar, Ann Santoro was at the same one, um, regarding this, and these are some of the questions that people brought up. Uh, you know, to, first of all, like uh, uh, Airbnbs and short-term rentals, is that something that would not be allowed and something like that? This, uh, they're really clear. And uh, one of the things, too, is uh, uh, I think M Michelle uh, mentioned about nuclear family. You could build it for that, but if it ever became vacant and you advertised it, you have to, it's like any rental property. It's, so if somebody qualifies and can afford it and so forth like that, they, they can make it. Uh, so Is that something that you want to ask Attorney Samarco about? No, uh, but okay. Well, um, no, okay. Is there something about opting back in? Is there no, but I was going to get to that too. And they said there was going to be a lot more legislation. And correct me if I'm wrong. They said there's legislation coming up, and they don't have the answers to these questions themselves yet in the presentation. But they said even if you opt out, there's going to be alternatives that will have to be drawn up and and brought forth. So it's it's not it's it's a moot point Roseanne because we as a town could always develop regulations that allow it period right and we could actually control it better we could opt out and then say okay we'll allow it but only when there's where there's one acre zoning and, and where there's some uh, maybe add further setbacks or with people aren't on septic systems or we could create our own that's, um, that's true, but with, with the proviso that the Act states that a municipality cannot uh, impose additional standards beyond those set forth in the Act. Yeah, I don't think we can. So we, couldn't, we could not, this, this came up at zoning as well. Uh, if the town decided to opt out and then do its own regulations, it could not enact regulations that were any stricter or harsher than what are already contained in 2129. Stricter or harsher. Correct. And as it stands right now, uh, any any lot, uh, any residential lot that has a single family dwelling uh, has, has to allow an yeah. ADU. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Um, I have one other thing while well, well, he's still standing there. Um, let me see, where is this? This is just so voluminous. Um, the law as it's passed does not allow any abutting or adjoin adjoining property owner to protest? That's correct. They are allowed as of right. Uh, no public right. hearing, no special permit. Uh, decision has to be made within 65 days of receipt of the application. Okay. That seems a bit unfair. That uh, people that other people that would be affected uh, do not have an opportunity to be heard. Okay. Any other questions for the town attorney? Then we can go through some deliberations. Well, I hope I, he's not going to go home. You'll be here, right? <laughs> I will be here. Oh, trust me, they, they stick around. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a couple questions. Four, they, four, Mark? Yes. Uh, Mr. Samarka? So the only zoning regulations that would apply are the setback regulations? Uh, what it states is that uh, beyond what's contained in the Act, local zoning, lo local zoning for whatever particular zone the house is in applies, uh, just cannot apply anything stricter 
you can, cannot apply stricter regulations to the AD. So whatever the zone is, whatever the setbacks for that zone are, would be an correct minimum total okay. area. Correct. Would there be an option to go to zoning board of appeals uh, to overcome those setbacks for a variance? For a variance, uh, I don't see why not. There's no provision in in the in the act for it one way or another. Okay, and regarding um, septic systems, would ledge light uh, authority over septic system design still be in place I would assume so yes assume so it, it's it's not it's not stated in here all, all it states regarding septic is it, it can't be considered a separate dwelling for connection fees um, I would assume as, as, as with sizes the leach field, all that would still apply uh, yeah okay yeah. if the leach field had to be expanded because of the number of yeah. Really, yeah. you'd have to comply uh, it, with yeah, it, it, all it those does, regulations. Correct. It does not speak to take anything away from uh, local public health authority. Okay. Thank you. Does the ownership stay in the same hands of the, as a main house owner? Yes. Okay. They couldn't condo it. They couldn't. Well, they it's couldn't it's as, sell as, it. as as was stated. There's a ma there's a maximum floor area. So you're looking at a thousand square feet. Yeah. Is but the ownership of it has to be. But the ownership, the ownership of both units are still stays one, with the original one deed. One you can't split and, that. And, and well, all what it states it is that you can't uh, you can't require a familial uh, or business relationship between uh, the principal dwelling and the ADU. But, but if a farmer put one on there and he wanted to divide his, his property, you could make it a separate unit someday, as long as it met the zoning requirements. Mm -hmm. So you can't do it on a small lot, but you certainly can do it on a larger lot that yeah. can be subdivided and still make the, meet the zoning requirements. You still have to meet all the requirements for subdivision. Correct. Correct. Well, I'm looking at this set, this uh, line on, we don't have a page number, it uh, begins with... Page 2. Oh, right. 228. Oh, I might go to Contain it's on this it's on the second page of our packet. Um, so the sentence begins with uh, binding recorded deeds which contain covenants or restrictions that require such accessory apartment be sold or rented. Does that mean that if they could that that if they decide that, that somebody, I, I, don't, I don't know what that means. Sorry, Ms. Hardy, I'm trying to find where you are. Okay, so. Page 2 of 28, is, is that it? where you are? Yeah. Page 2 of 28 at the top, substitute House Bill 6107. Top. Uh, oh, oh you're, you're in the definitions, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry, let me, let me move back here. And what see. number? Where are you? Right at the top of the page. Okay. Yeah. It says restrictions that require such accessory apartment be sold or rented. So does that mean that at some point they could sell, uh, the yeah. homeowner could sell the, uh, the ancillary if, or accessory apartment? If, if, if you look on page one, uh, that is the definition of an affordable accessory apartment. That is not uh, what, yeah. that, that, is, that is different than uh, the accessory dwelling unit okay. we're speaking of here. Paragraph two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, paragraph one is yeah. accessory wow. apartment. Well, that's, that's what I'm inquiring. If, is, right. yeah. Can the accessory apartment be at some point be sold by itself? Certainly. So half of your house could be sold? I, I don't know why someone would do that, but <laughs> if... Yeah. Well, the lot would have to go with it, certainly, yeah. yeah. But there's one lot, two units. Mm -hmm. You'd have to do right. something if you couldn't do it. Yeah, one. yeah, without... Correct. You have to subdivide the lot. It'd have to be a big enough lot. It'd be a big enough lot. It'd have to be subdivided, certainly. Yeah. So you'd have to subdivide. Yeah. 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 And have to get a subdivision. Right. So it's very rare that that would occur. Right. Unless it's considered a condo. Right. Unless you condo-wise it's on the house. There's. Right. Staying with the rental part of it, I think, probably tonight. Uh, did you have questions? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, so usually in a statutory scheme and, and where something's, you know, the legislature thinks something's a good idea, you get an, an opportunity to opt out. Um, 
What's what's the downside? Why, what's the uh, what's the punishment for uh, opting out? Punishment? Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, if the legislature it, obviously they're uh, advancing this legislation, and uh, but they've given municipalities the opportunity to opt out. What's is there something we we're not seeing that uh, is a disincentive for municipalities to opt out? I, I wouldn't presume to try to guess what the legislative intent was. Um, all I can say is there is nothing in the act that provides an incentive or disincentive uh, one way or another for a town to either uh, opt in or opt out. Okay, because I, I, I couldn't see it. I mean, I went through it and I was trying to see if there was something that in there that would... Uh, the penalty part of it. Yeah, yeah sneak yeah. up on us. Uh, no, nothing Nothing right. we've no, seen. Yeah. No, yeah, but there's going to be changes. Nothing, nothing in the OLR yeah. uh, research either. Thank you. Because I couldn't see it. Any other questions? Um, and, of course, they're not, again, uh, um, Attorney Zamarka and Attorney O'Connell will not leave the building yet. Uh, the, they're still here for our resources. Well, look, I do more. Yeah, okay. Is there going to be one tax bill? Yes. Yes. One tax bill to the main owner? Correct. Okay. So the, ta the tax bill goes to goes to the property owner. So to the town, it's one, one property? Correct. Which makes sense. Okay. Thank you. It, um, like a duplex. It's yep. It's going to be an accessory dwelling Right. So it just gets appraised in with the, the house. Right. Yes. 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 Correct. Yep. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So all zoning except for setbacks go away. Maybe I heard there was an opportunity to do some, you know, architectural guidance maybe added to it. But now the state is no it, architectural it guidance. Well, so unless you did it locally to. To, to, to be just just so we're clear what it states is uh, there can't be any uh, landscaping or architectural uh, rules applied to the ADU that are not also applied to okay, the so principal can't dwelling have any new ones okay and if the legislature adds more guidance to this bill and we opt in and it we don't know what we're buying into there's a chance that what's there today could have more things added to it that the residents of this town may not be in agreement with. Possible. I, I don't know what they're trying to expand on. I've heard testimony tonight or statements tonight that it's a very general bill and the state's going to work on trying to add more definition to it. Um, I really personally believe in the concept of this unit, but I very frustrating that we can't control that locally. We can't put anything in place that could mm -hmm. help control it and make it meet the need. The need's there. I think that's obvious. This town is a very affluent town and it's very difficult and I, I believe in the, the need to take care of that population, but I just struggle that whether we opt in or opt out, Today, we opt out now and then try and do something later. We still have to comply with the full ADU guidance. And that ADU guidance may change a little bit. And I'm not saying it's going to get worse. I'm not trying to predict doomsday. But that's state law. And if we ever want to do ADUs in this town, we're going to have to comply with it, is my understanding. Right. That's correct. Okay. Wow. Well put. Zoning from above. As it was stated, zoning from Hartford. Any other questions for Attorney Zamarka? And then we. I did have one other yeah. thing that I thought was odd. Uh, it states regulation shall not require ADUs to have an exterior door. How are they supposed to get out of the unit if they don't have an exterior Through your door? house. Uh, rem remember, there are three types of accessory dwelling units. It can be located within the principal dwelling, attached to the principal dwelling or detached. So I do believe that section you're referring to uh, also is subject to local building codes as well. I've got to say this is, in all my years, this is the most convoluted, mm -hmm. thrown together piece of legislation that I've ever seen. And it's really not just about accessory dwelling units. 
if you read it very carefully. Mm -hmm. It's about state overreach, trying to control what our town can do. And there are a lot of things in here that are just unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just, I don't know how we would enforce this. We've got one zoning enforcement officer. Right. Uh, our building inspect, our building department is already stressed out. Uh, we've had to hire extra help there already. Um, but at this point, we're addressing questions, so I'll reserve my comments, personal comments. We'll get right to the comments right after this. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, I got a yes, sir. Sorry. If we opt out, could a town resident come to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a variance to put an ADU on, and would that ADU have to comply with the regulation even though we opted out? No, could not. So that is an option to meet the need. Yeah. We can't control that as a board of selectmen because it's the board of zoning appeals that would have to issue those. You're saying that no, 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 no. I, I'm sorry. I yeah. want to be clear, Mr. Dago. No, uh, if if it is not an allowed use, it's not an allowed use. A variance would not change that. Really? Correct. If it was an addition to um to someone's house, it, it, it's not an allowed use in the town, and it, they're not. Um, <coughs> Stressed or um, what's the term? Hardship. Hardship. Undue, undue, undue hardship. Hardship. Unique to the property. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Zilorka. And, this, and this may, these units may not <laughs> count towards our uh, our affordable housing. That's correct. Well, that's the, that's correct. No so, kidding. So again, we add housing, and when it, it, we cannot meet. This impossible goal that, the state, that the state has set, right. uh, because 30 percent has to be affordable, and then you add 70 percent of additional housing, you can never make the goal that the state has set. 10 percent. It's right. impossible. No, no, correct. It doesn't mean we the 8-30G guidelines to uh, reach our 10 percent affordable housing, which is already a flawed law because. All those units fall off after 30 years. 30 or 40. 30, I think. They fall off, so meanwhile, you're always chasing it because stuff's leaving out the back door. And meanwhile, we come up with another affordable housing, supposedly, and then this doesn't even count. We've had that happen. That. We've had units. And meanwhile, fall. we're one of the most successful towns in the area, in the region, for adding affordable housing units into our stock. True. With four built or being built and another one uh, proposed, um, a larger one being proposed and uh, being approved with conditions currently. I'm sorry for being so slow, but no. understand the detached unit wouldn't be allowed. But if, if a property owner wanted to add an addition to their house within the setbacks and wanted to add a kitchen and a bedroom and a living room, and not call it an ADU, they could create an apartment without violating our current zoning laws, correct? The town currently allow, allows, pardon me, in-law apartments, but uh, those uh, do not allow kitchens. And no they're, kitchens. Uh, I believe they're a single bedroom efficiency. So we could we could change that borders. zoning. We could change that zoning law, couldn't we? To allow additions to have kitchens locally? That's that's you something. Have to change the zoning. Yeah, have to change change zoning. Right. yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to that, understand that would how be up to the we could accommodate falls, this. Um, <clears throat> but if this falls as an accessory, the definition turns into an accessory unit. Then you have to, right. I read it, go all or nothing with this. So I have to comply. Well, if, it's, if it's an addition to the house, it might not be an accessory, accessory. unit because it's in the main dwelling. Mm. If it has a kitchen, mm. that's a good point. Okay. You've rented a couple rooms in your house, but now if you put a kitchen in, yeah. it's not a lot. No, several people have two kitchens in their house, one upstairs and one downstairs. <laughs> you got their names? <laughs> Thank you, Mark. How would we like to proceed? Want to have some conversation? Um, I know we've all taken notes. I know we thought about it. Two of us um, were chairman of the Zoning Commission in our past life. Um, 
so we know the zoning regulations intimately and the effects that that might have. Um, I'd like to hear from Kevin first. Does he attend? <laughs> yeah. Does he attended? Uh, what else did you learn? Explanatory. Sessions? Well, I think uh, one of the comments made yesterday uh, by the, the presenters was this was a great idea, but the law needs a lot of work. We heard that yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and they said that there's going to be some more legislation coming forward in the uh, short session coming up uh, between February and May. And there were a lot of questions about that, about, you know, can we opt back in? Can we opt out? And, uh, you know, some good questions, as I brought up about the, uh, you know, if you can, if, if it was approved, and yes, you could let the uh, build an accessory for a family unit, a uh, family member, but if it ever became vacant, then, you know, the same would apply to, you know, renting it to anybody. Um, uh, one of the things, too, is I know in the POCD it talks about the neighborhood character. That's one of the things that was brought forward is they said the character is too nebulous of a comment and they said they didn't want to use character because it's, they said it's too restrictive. So it's, it's, it was kind of a difficult thing as far as what does it mean by something that would fit the character of a neighborhood or an area. So a lot of concerns. Also, too, you know, in an area where right now, uh, you know, they're probably moving it down to smaller lots to where, it, uh, you know, as long as it fits the setbacks, but it could overcrowd small areas. If you have a, an acre and a half or, or an acre or whatever, that might be a little different. So they, uh, everyone thought it was, I think everyone in the room, uh, and the, that, I think that was the overflow room too, because there's everybody in there. Everybody was very much in favor of the intent and the meaning of it, but they just felt there was just too much, um, uh, you know, it was basically all our way or no way, our way or, no, or the highway, and yeah. that's where a lot of the concerns came. And, you know, some of the people from uh, Darien, w uh, Westport, have said how they've addressed some of their, not, he, he spoke really well how they've addressed some of their uh, affordable housing and gotten more in and so forth, but that was the overriding thing. It was the, okay, it's all or nothing, and it doesn't allow input. And here again, I think uh, Steve Larson made a good point. If we'd been addressing this all along, you know, maybe it wouldn't have been necessary by the state. So the state gives us something, and you know, one thing that was made very clear is there's going to be alternatives. If you do opt out, it's not as if you've opted out and let's move on. It's going to be okay. What is your plan moving forward now to to meet the uh, concerns that uh, they're trying to address? Mm -hmm. So that was well presented. And am I missing anything? I think, I think okay. You I, yeah. You can't really. I know, but I mean, but she was there, so if I'm I missing something important. I will. Thank you. I, I will make note that we did have a letter submitted as well. It's in your packet this evening uh, from a concerned citizen um, for testimony. Um, uh, Mark Salerno, you were chairman of zoning for half a dozen years or so? Yeah, right after you. Yeah. Um, so, some things that struck me immediately, and I did read the zoning minutes. There's no public hearing, uh, so there's no right for the, the um, neighbors uh, to address or to try to appeal it, um, as it will, could impact them. Most of our regulations allow for that. Um, so that kind of takes that out. Um, it's, the way I read it is it's, this is a one-size-fits-all for the whole state. It doesn't allow us to make any changes unless we make it more, uh, less restrictive. Um, so that takes a little bit of creativity. It doesn't allow the town to customize it to this town, and that's what I kind of read from the zoning commission. Um, East Lime has been a leader, as Mark said, in affordable housing. Since I've been involved, we've doubled our housing stock. We were down at 2 or 3% at one point, mm -hmm. and I think we're up at 5 or 6% right now. So we have been doing our part to increase affordable housing. We allowed incentive housing zones. That was one of the last things mm -hmm. I did in this town. We found areas downtown, um, up in Flanders, that could have affordable housing, and we incentivized it. We have done our part, and we continue to. We did, Zoning Commission just approved another uh, affordable housing co complex. Um, I'm a little concerned about sewer capacity. We're very tight on sewer capacity right now. I know it's not going to double overnight. We're not going to double our population overnight. But if we have a new subdevelopment coming, they got to go through all these approval processes to make sure that we have capacity. Um, traffic. One of the number one complaints I hear since I've been on this board and since I was on zoning commission was traffic. 
Our subdivisions are designed for traffic flow. The exits, the, all the, the traffic uh, stop signs, it's all based on traffic flow. We require traffic engineers um, and studies to come in. So all of a sudden, that gets thrown out the window. We could essentially double the traffic in a development. So that's kind of counter to all the planning we've been doing here. Do I think it's going to happen? We're going to double on a street over? No, it's not going to happen overnight, but it could. And it just takes a little bit of the, uh, I'm not going to say control, but a little bit of the design out of our commission's hands. Um, what else do I, there's, there's a lot of unknowns here. Um, the zoning commission has approved it. I've read their reasons. I've read their concerns. I think they're legitimate. They're asking for us to, uh, to confirm their decision, and I think we should respect that. But those are some of my, my concerns. And, and I think, I don't think, I, I agree with you, it's convoluted. A bad law with good intent doesn't make it a good law. It needs work. And I don't think if we say no right now, we're never going to allow this in the future, we could have allowed, this town could have allowed this for 20 years. It was never a pressing need for this. We could have done this all along. But right now, we can't do it. We either have to go all in, or we can't have anything in between. So it's either going to be all nothing or all in. We can't say, yes, we want it, but we want to have uh, owners, owners live in the house. Can't do it. That's the way I read it. Correct. Um, so those are some of my concerns. That's a good start. Uh, Mr. Daigle, why don't we go back and forth here? I um, all, all I can say, you know, I, I alluded to earlier that you know there may be more un things we don't like if they modify the bill. The only hope we have of ever <coughs> wanting to do something in this town, in this area, is if the statute gets improved and allows some type of control. And who knows what's going to happen? It's already being pushed on us without any control at all and if the towns and cities of this state work with the legislature to try and add some controls back in that makes it more reasonable to to institute that's our only hope because we opt out we don't meet the need and I don't think the need is double uh, it may be one percent five percent who knows what people want to do with their properties who knows what their family situations are the only hope we have to be able to meet that need, however big or small it is, is if the statute gets improved and allows some level of control. Because without the control, as a minimum, it's going to upset neighbors. Now, someone good intentions puts a nice separate dialogue on, they match the style of the house, they can do that if they like. Or they can buy a tiny house from a manufacturer and plop it on their property with this rule. And some tiny houses, some of them look nice. But on the other hand, I, I just struggle with that. All I can hope is the state legislature listens to the concerns that are raised and takes this statute and makes it not a cop launched, do whatever you want to do property owner. Because that's what I see that it's allowing it to be done. It's got allowing it uh, to happen. And I think that could cause more grief than the benefit to the residents who uh, could benefit from a family member or extra income on their property, personally. Thank you, Mr. Dago. Uh, Mrs. Hardy? Are we limiting ourselves to five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> no one limits you, Mrs. Hardy. Okay, so... Um, Could you put that mic down just so... I've spent a lot of time reviewing this, and as a matter of fact, I was looking at it at 4 o'clock this morning. Uh, it's ta I've taken that much time to go over it, and as I said earlier, this, to me, is far more than just the issue of accessory apartments. Mm -hmm taking away the rights to appear at a public hearing, uh, <clears throat> not allowing abutting landowners an opportunity to be heard, 
<clears throat> We've heard a lot about East Lyme being expensive. Yes, but it's consistent with all of the shoreline communities. There's a cost if you want to live in a quality town. Somebody has to pay the expenses. Somebody has to pay the cost. This bill is not clear. Matter of fact, it's very muddled about how these accessory buildings would be taxed and whether it would be uh, also tied to the individual's income that was inhabiting the house. I thought that was very confusing. There were other things in here as well, um, allowing uh, not only the ancillary houses, um, pre-made houses, but also trailer parks, and allowing trailers, live-in live trailers, on the main lot. I think that this is just, it's a hodgepodge. There are things in here that make absolutely no sense. Uh, one of the things that I found was um, a regulation on whether or not there would be spring water. And, um, and uh, what, what to do about that, the access to spring water. What, what is this? Uh, it also forbids you to prohib prohibit, you may not prohibit the operation of any family child care home or group child care home in a residential zone. Uh, there can be no regulations to prohibit that. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, including mobile manufactured homes uh, having as their narrowest dimension 22 feet or more. Uh, it, you can include uh, mobile home parks. Uh, I, I just think, it, to me, it's just, it's just a muddle, and I don't know how we could uh, how we how we could fairly regulate this with our existing staff. Um, and as I said, I think you know some somebody has to pay the bills. If you're going to use the full services and only pay a fraction of the cost of those services, then somebody else will have to pick up the cost, unless we're going to get some kind of outside financing. Um, our state representative and our state senator voted against this. They heard, they endured hours of testimony on this. And they still aren't certain on some of the provisions and how they would be carried out. Our zoning commission listened to numerous testimony and they opted out. This is, they're the, they're the agency that's really going to be stuck with handling this. And I don't think that opting out means never. To me, it means that we have to do some. We have to come up with a plan that's manageable, that's affordable, and also the fact that this does not help us at all with affordable housing, and we're still going to be faced with a commitment for that. Um, and I, uh, I resent the implication that this that an opt out indicates that we do not want minorities. I, I really resent that because I think it's, it is a matter of, it's not a matter of skin color. Uh, it's a matter of fairness for all, which includes them, but it also includes other people that have rights as well. So if I'm thinking that I have a home which I mean, think, I've heard from numerous real estate agents, and I've asked, how do you, when people come to this, when people come looking for a house, what do they, how do they, what do they do? They said, well, most of the time they want to drive around town, they want to look at neighborhoods, they want to see, gee, is this a neighborhood I'd like to live in? Uh, that's how they make their decision. If you want to live in a very close, closely knit neighborhood, you know that that's what you're going to get if you go to, Crescent Beach, or you go to Black Point, you're going to be living with very close neighbors. <coughs> you buy a one acre lot in a residential area that's, that, that's the regulation, that there be one acre lots. Now, somebody who has the one acre lot, now can next year look out and see the trees cut behind their house and see an, an accessory dwelling there 
They can see one to the left of their property, to the right, and they can also look across the street and see it. It seems to me that those people have some rights as well as to what they wanted when they came in to do into a, a development. And um, I just I just think that this this bill is not the way to go. And we know that we're obligated to do something if we opt out. And I think if we opt out, then that one of the first things that we do is establish a subcommittee to work on this and get it going. But uh, I think as somebody already said, this is one size fits all. And I just don't think that this as it is presented is what our town needs. So I will be voting to opt out. Thank you. Mr. Franklin. Yeah. Well, so I, I've studied it uh, as well. And I wasn't up at 4 in the morning, maybe 3 in the morning. Um, and uh, my initial reaction when I, when I started reviewing it and, and uh, from uh, went on at the zoning meeting. I, I, I was in support of, of what the uh, zoning board's action was to, to opt out. <clears throat> and then I, I, I went around and I tried to pull as, as many people as I could to get their opinion and their reasoning, uh, pro or con. And uh, my ideas have shifted on, on my position on this bill. Um, We've, we've had an opportunity to make changes, and we and we didn't. And we are where we are tonight, and now we're having something shoved at us from the state. And I don't like that. I don't like Hartford telling us what to do. I don't like it one damn bit. But um, municipalities have, have failed to acknowledge a huge problem. And, and that problem is providing place for people that maybe don't have the means that some of us have uh, uh, to have a decent place to live. And many of you know I'm an attorney, and, and one of the things that I do is uh, I, I deal with a lot of people that are in financial distress. And I see some of the situations that they face, and they cannot find a decent place to live. And, 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 the, and they are totally freaked out, and, and rents are going up to $1,800, $2,200 a month. Uh, and, and not everybody can afford that. And we, we talk about the quality of life here in East Line. Well, if we're going to have a quality of life, we have to take it on our shoulders to accommodate and help people uh, to live a decent life and have a place to be. And if we can't do that, then all this wonderfulness about East Line is, is, is just fluff. It's not real. So let's be real. Uh, I'm going to support, I'm going to oppose, it's double negative, I'm, I'm going to support the bill. And um, I, I think it's time, it's a, there's a sea change facing us. If we don't do it, we'll have an opportunity to, to uh, have some regulations that work around this and, and try to make it fair uh, and still be within the bounds of the statute. But I think it's time to take a step back and acknowledge that there is a problem. We need to deal with it. And there's going to be some risks. And, and I don't like some, you know, there's some people, this could be a money grab. Yeah, I can put a little accessory building on my house and pick up an extra 1800 bucks a month. Great, nice. And there's going to be people that do that. And uh, this isn't going to solve the affordable housing problem. But it is going to provide some opportunities in that regard. And I think there's enough of a help that uh, I'm willing to, su to support this. That's where I stand. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Mr. Sear, you want to add uh, to your comments? Yeah, sure. I, I think the legislature brought this to our attention because they recognize the problem. And it's one we've all known has been there for a long time. And it's a concern. My concern is this bill is a little too broad and restrictive to the town um, and all the towns, too. Um, what I'm hoping, I, I'm going to support opting out, but I think what we're going to have to do really quickly and within the next couple of meetings of the Board of Selectmen and working with zoning is come up with some type of committee 
to address this and come up with something that is fair and equitable so we can get people because Dan's right uh, a lot of you know you talk about a lot of people who have graduated from our school system and that uh, and that they no longer live in town they can't a lot of times they can only do it if they can get some assistance or you know supportive uh, family so uh, I don't like and like I said I heard a lot yesterday that was a lot of red flags regarding the, the bill as it's written now but we have to come forward with a plan to make this an opportunity if not only to have uh, I, Michelle got up a really good point with you know parents you, you want your parents close to not necessarily an in-law because they have want to be as independent as possible have something like an, an accessory dwelling unit but we need to start working on this now and not you know wait a year or two and see what the state does because you know we always complain when the state does something so they've done something now let's use it as a call to action for us to come up with a better plan that allows people to come into town allows them to possibly put accessory units in certain areas and do something that is fair to everybody but i will support uh opting out of this current uh, public act thank you mr siri i'll um I, i've done a lot of thinking about this i, I chaired zoning for eight years or so um the, the bill is flawed dramatically the number one conversation at ccm over the last year was this bill the number one that ccm is the connecticut council of municipalities where all the ceos the chief elected officials and commission members will go and discuss um the legislative committee uh, that i sit on um talks about upcoming legislation we hear from legislators we talk about this and yes ccm is a lobbying uh group um, I don't know if they, if they classify themselves as lobbying, but they, they go and fight for the municipalities. And, and number one, why would Hartford want to start z enforcing zoning from up above when each town uh, has always done it? Um, it's, it's a flawed bill. The, the 8-30G, which allows a developer to come in and, and thumb their nose at zoning and put whatever they want without architectural standards, without um, cause for um, you know, density issues and all that, they, they, they put whatever they want. And we've seen this at Oswegatchie Hills, we've heard the argument for 20 plus years now, but we've had other housing developments go in. That's a flawed bill. It was a flawed bill, the, the, one, the, the one that you um, approved, the incentivized affordable housing zones. It was, afford it was flawed because the state was supposed to pay the developers to come in and build affordable housing in those zones. And they ran out of money. That was all, there was all money backed behind there. You, we, you approved the downtown affordable housing area and on Flanders Road where Midway Mall is. And if the state actually backed up their own affordable housing incentive zone, a developer would come in and actually benefit from building affordable housing. So they passed the bill but didn't put money behind it. I think Zoning Commission got it right. I think um, they're, you know, we're, we're here to protect the current landowners. And if I buy a, a single family home in a neighborhood, I should have a reasonable right to not think it's gonna turn into a duplex neighborhood. Not every house is going to do it. It's not the boogeyman. I appreciate that and the the, the visual, but in, in, we don't have nineteen thousand people clamoring to get in. All all really good points tonight, pro and con. Um, and I really appreciate this opportunity to serve the town and have these conversations because it's a great community conversation, and it will continue because we're going to have great people uh, on this commission that have great things to say on either side of this conversation. But we need to protect the, the current property owner. And I do believe that um, if my left neighbor to the left and neighbor to the right, neighbor to the rear, neighbor across the street are all putting up accessory dwelling units, um, maybe my property does go down in value because maybe that person driving around town looking around um, East Lyme for a property says, ooh, maybe not this one because it's not really a single family community sewer is a real issue in this town we are at capacity and and, and this doesn't address that um, it's a it's a real problem 
and we've re just we just renegotiated the three tr tr town agreement the tri town agreement and we did not get extra capacity we have an opportunity to maybe buy into it at some point that we are at a limit with capacity and i'm going to put it on the record schools is an issue it costs twenty thousand dollars plus to educate a child in this town we are not going to get the tax benefit from a thousand square foot unit in the back of someone's house when this young person or young couple with their two kids, maybe not that, maybe it's one, they come in to get their foot in the door, it was said, no, no, I, I don't think we should be encouraging extra kids in our system. Because if a third of our population is going to be over 65 in the year 2025, those people are paying for that $20,000 per kid. And you know, if it's getting unaffordable, if this town's getting unaffordable, it is the education that's driving that. Education is very important, but it takes up 75% of the tax dollars you send in. If the, if the average homeowner is paying $10,000 a year in taxes, 7,500 is going right over to the Board of Ed. 2,500 is to pay for all the rest. Security, the roads, the lights, the infrastructure. There is no way to control this Airbnb situation in the summer rentals. They can say it's not it's not what the intent is, but there's no way to enforce that. We already struggled with that, um, and that's 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 a real that's a real concern. And this will not preserve open space. A farmer with 200 acres up on the north side of town is still going to sell his property and develop it if if nobody wants to take over the family farm and he wants he wants to cash out. That is, uh, that's what I have to say tonight. Um, there's, there's plenty of other reasons as well. I, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed to learn from the town attorney, um, attorneys that we couldn't come up with something a little bit more reasonable on our own. And if we, even if we had something reasonable on the books right now, it wouldn't, the new law throws that out and says, no, no, you're going to put this everywhere in your town and you're going to do it this way. You can't have architectural review. You, um, you can't consider all these other things. So um, whatever we come up with, whatever your, your group comes up with, with in a subcommittee situation, it's still got to abide by the state's regulations at some point. But it's a flawed law. We see these things develop. I think there'll be a round two and a round three, and maybe we can get to somewhere. I don't think the affordable housing is expensive to live here. It's expensive to live in southeastern Connecticut. But this law was, 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 was conceived um, because of a, a situation very specifically in Westport. Um, and then you go to Greenwich and then you go to the, um, you know, the Fairfield counties and, and where, where people who work in those communities can't live in those communities. And we do have a very diverse housing stock. Um, and we'd also have affordable housing in our town. So um, that said, is there any other, are there any other comments? I did find the yes, section on spring water. Okay. <laughs> Provide for conditions on operations to collect spring water as defined in section 21A. <laughs> hmm. Just makes you wonder. So we can't stop that. From, yeah, yeah, I know, right. Any other uh, comments or questions that we can take a vote? I'll read the motion here. Yeah. Move that, whereas Public Act 21-29, the act creates a new use titled accessory apartments, also referred to as accessory dwelling units, ADUs. The act requires municipalities to adopt zoning -like regulations allowing one such apartment as a right on each lot that contains a single family dwelling and to designate other areas where such apartments are allowed. And whereas the act allows municipalities to opt out of the ADU provisions of Public Act 21-29 and whereas the East Lyme Zoning Commission followed the opt out provision of the act and by a two thirds majority voted to opt out of the ADU provisions of Public Act 21-29 and whereas the pursuant to the act of the, present the East Lyme Board of Selecting acting as the town's legislative body may complete the process by opting out by a two-thirds vote. And whereas the board has carefully considered and discussed the ADU provisions of the act, now therefore it is resolved that the Eastline Board is selected by a two-third vote 
hereby firmly opts out of the provisions of Public Act 21-29 regarding accessory apartments or accessory dwelling units pursuant to Section 6F of Public Act 21-29. Second. Motion's been made. Motion's been seconded. Any further comments? Yeah. If the vote goes to opt out tonight, I think it's incumbent upon the town, the zoning commission, and our residents to identify to our state representatives, not just our local representatives, but to the leader, leaders up in Hartford, what we, this town would like to see in this modified in this bill so that we can accommodate this need um, without having little or no control over it. And I would ask that the next Board of Selectmen and the, the Board of and the Zoning Commission within, in the Subcommittee Act go document that and have the town provide that type of input to our legislators and to the legislative leaders. Thank you. I'm sure we would like some newly made civilians who would like to volunteer their time to come on that too, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'll be getting a phone call. Yes. Mm -hmm. Kevin's going to have a great opportunity um, when he's involved with the legislative uh, committee at CCM to voice those concerns, and, um, and maybe your committee will be able to feed you some information to bring forward. It's a great opportunity to, to move, that, to move the, that information. And it's a good point, Mr. Dago. Any other comments? I'll call the vote. All in favor of the motion to opt out, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Does one uh, abstain? Uh, one. Any abstentions? I don't think so. So there's a 5 1 0 vote. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the attorney, town attorneys for their advice and making themselves available this evening. Thank you very much. Is there anything else on the agenda you're staying for? I don't believe so. Okay. Get him off. Yeah. You can stay as a citizen. <laughs> oh, he's going, you're staying because there's something else here. The, uh, yeah. The other items. Got it. Um, the, the 3A on the agenda is a discussion of possible action. We, there is an ARP funding, um, I guess, request that I'm bringing forward to you as there is a time issue. Um, prices go up um, at the end of the calendar year. Mrs. Johnson, you're going to make a presentation on this? Sure, so you'll come to the podium so we can hear you. And this is a time and attendance. Um, basically, we still punch clocks around here and we use three-part carbon paper to, for leaf slips, et cetera, et cetera. And we'd like to um, get up to speed into the 21st century and, and, and have the proper um, time and attendance tracking system. So, well, well, thank you for that lead-in. So, um, as Mr. Nickerson indicated, we are um, asking um, for um, authorization to proceed to purchase an automated time and attendance system. What we're doing now is um, really manual. It's time-consuming. Um, oftentimes, the carbonated lead forms are uh, carbonated. <laughs> <laughs> goes with the spring water. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. We, you get the, okay. Um, they're not completed p prior to the employees taking the time off, and the manual tracking does, does lead to errors. It's time-consuming for payroll processing, supervisors, and employees. Um, an automated upgrade uh, will allow employees to be more responsible for tracking their time, allow supervisors to approve leave and attendance more efficiently. Um, so um, with this system, um, the data can be uploaded um, into our existing um, accounting software system as well as the new system that we're in the process of. Um, we did obtain, we did have demonstrations from three different vendors, um, one Paycom, uh, the second one, Novertime, which is Andrews Technology, and Munis, which is Tyler Technologies. Um, in addition, we um, took a poll of other cities and towns to see um, if they were using um, time and attendance systems, and if so, what ones they were using. And um, it was, uh, Novertime is used by a lot of cities and towns. Um, 
So, um, and with an automated system, we'll no longer need time cards uh, and the, um, the forms that we're using, um, as well as we're not going to need to store them. We're not going to need to seek permission from the state to destroy them. We're not going to need to get them shredded. So there's, you know, like a lot of, process, you know, like uh, manual processes in the background that we'll be able to eliminate. The other thing is um, we've also... Um, uh, Mr. Bergaw has been looking into getting a, a keyless um, entry to the doors, uh, you know, around the town hall. And so um, we've looked into that if, so like um, with the time, the, 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 the clocks we're going to purchase, we're looking to purchase, um, you can use um, IDs, uh, RFD ID cards to um, be able to clock in and use the system. And you can also use um, a key fob type um, device. And these same devices can be used on um, a, a system to unlock the doors. So, you know, it'll we'll get into um, doing different multi-purpose, uh, you know, use of, for multi-purpose. Um. And then also the fact that, um, you know, it, it's a system that's used by uh, many cities and towns, it, it'll allow us to network to be able to get, you know, the maximum use out of the system. So um, the total implementation cost of uh, the system is uh, $67,392, which includes um, hosting for up to 200 empl 250 employees. And then um, for two months of the year, it'll be an additional $347 because of all the seasonal employees that we have on board for um, Parks and Rec in Jul the months of July and August. Um, for uh, $18,320 for the terminals that we need to purchase. Um, and then um, we're going to need to get what's called a zebra badge printer to be able to print the, um, uh, to print the, the cards. And um, $4,800 for HID cards. And then the $16,450 for implementation and annual software and hardware maintenance. Um, so this is the initial purchase, and then once we're beyond the first year, the annual maintenance cost will be $25,822. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Just, just, uh, if I could just, the 22, let's talk about the annual maintenance costs. Yep. Do we have any costs now? Well, we, we're not Other than we, destroying the, you know, the shredding and the Well, there's that. So we have to purchase um, time cards, and then we purchase the um, leave slips. And then, really, um, these leave slip come in and, and um, I mean, come in in droves, like a, a pile of paper an inch, an inch, an inch and a half thick, um, you know, every day, every other day. Um, it takes about an hour, let's say an average of an hour a day of staff time to look at these forms, re, um, look up in the system to see if the employee has the time, you know, sign off on the slip, and then record it, you know, you know, record it in the system that someone is um, requesting to take the time off. Whereas... So the efficiency we talk, we've talked about, that, you know, th this is just overbearing and uh, ridiculously, um, what's the word? Cumbersome. Um, will we leave? We'll, we'll loosen up some some man hours or person hours. I guess we'd say it now uh, to be able to better utilize somewhere else. You mentioned that you're a staff of. Uh, you could use some space, some some time f for people to help you out with some or administrative in other areas. support. Yes. So we'd be Correct. able to better efficiently run your finance department instead of having someone spend half their day with triplicate forms and filing and, and doing the things that they have to do. So the 25000 although that will be an expense, uh, we'll get some better efficiencies out of the, the people that are working for us because they'll be doing something more productive. Correct, yes. I'd like to say we're going to save the 25000 in, in man hours. Um, well, we've, we've also, there's also been talk about taking on a, um, another floater position. So if, you know, if we can get more efficient in other areas and, you know, have some free staff, you know, some staff time, that opens up um, the opportunity for us to do some, um, you know, interdepartmental cr cross training. Great. Other questions? How does this qualify for the uh, rescue funding? 
There's a letter in your packet. Yeah. Uh, it has been checked out by the town attorney uh, mm -hmm. for qualifications. You'll note that he mentions um, the electronic, being able to work from home, because it's part of this COVID cool. money is, it, we, is the preparation of a possible shutdown again mm -hmm. someday. And um, what we found is um, we still had to have people come back into the town hall to process payroll, to process uh, all this time and attendance. Um, really, again, the cumbersome of a triplicate form that has to go in three different ways and two different people si signing off on it and all that, that we'll be able to efficiently run government off-site if necessary. And that's, I think, the angle that the letter from Mr. Uh, O'Connell, who penned it himself. Brilliant. <laughs> um, <laughs> it brought tears to my eyes when I read it. Um, so that's, that's, that's the direction we're going in. Um, I, I read the letter, but I wanted it in the record. Okay. For the Board of Finance. I know. Two questions. Um, this is going to require someone to go on, like, uh, a website to fill in their t hours. Is that what the houses will work? The software. So, so what it's going to what it's going to be is you'll have either um, it will either use um, RFD badges or some type of a um, an RFD fob, and they'll be able to um, you know clock in at the clock you know at the clock. But then there are also other opportunities to be able to do it um, via desktop. To go manually put it in, manually put it. Well, I think you can. You would be able to. Um, Sign in. Sign in somehow, yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you, is there an option for phones? For example, you have some people that are out on the road all day, you know. Be, can they clock in, clock out with their phones so that they don't have to go to the office or... We we have we it does have those capabilities, um, but like we're gonna we'd like to start with everyone using like um, clocks that are in the building with the fobs and in, in the um, the RFD cards, but there is capabilities of uh, having access from other devices, and that's where you know the remoteness come you know comes in in the event that you know we want to restrict um, people from coming to our buildings. So it's expandable potentially. It's the more definitely expandable. The There's the bio stuff that you know would take your temperature as you punch. We're not buying that part of it, but you could get the the temperature as someone's punching in. Or you know, or do a fingerprint or an eyeball thing. I mean, there's all sorts of expandable uh, modules. Okay. Um, should we have that need? But we're going with a really basic system because it's a municipality. Yeah. How many town employees do we have? Not counting the summer ones. Roughly. So we have we have um, say about 125 full-time equivalents, and then we have. Um, we have part-time, part-time um, firefighters, part-time dispatchers. So our average, you know, weekly payroll is up over 200. So 200. We're buying capacity for 250. 250, correct. And then expandable another 50 during July, July and August. Uh, the supervisor is going to review and approve straight and overtime on a daily basis, weekly basis. How are they going to use the system? Who's going to authorize? It's going to be approval? it's going to be the supervisor. So we're going to you know you set up. Um, I think um, so. You have you have the supervisors, and then each supervisor has access to their you know to their particular employees. employees. Yeah. So if like as an if an employee wants to put in a request to use any type of um, personal time off. Then they um, go in, they enter their request, and the nice thing about it is, if they don't have the time, it's not going to let them put their request in. Like, like now, believe it or not, we have employees that put in leave slips that really don't have the time to take off that they're so asking the for. So supervisors today don't have access to their leave balance. It's because it's done manually. That's correct. But you put you you keep track of it on a spreadsheet, right? Yes, just that's in like your office or just an HR office. Correct. So the supervisor up in the public safety building can't look in to see if his or her employee has time. They that's have to make a phone call and you have to look it up. That's correct. Okay. okay. Of that 125 employees, how many are full-time computer at their desks? 
25, 50, just rough numbers. Half? So let's no. say about, say 30 to 40 percent, I would say. say 40 percent of 150 is whatever. Um, quick red gun on to 60. So 60 people have a computer that they can use to log in and log off. So it was that factored into the number of terminals you get, the, the equivalent of the clock that you pass your RFID under? Do we need a, an RFID tag in this building if everyone, if everyone in this building has a computer? And they can log on, and if, and if they can access their computer from home, and I don't know if that's capable, but I think it is. We, we do on. have, I mean, at this point now, everyone, um, just about, pretty much everyone is back working in the building. Um, when we w were w working remote, not everyone um, had the ability to work remote. It was yeah. somewhat limited. So um, at that point, we, w we made arrangements for the other staff to um, had, have staggered time in, in the individual offices. Because um, I don't know if that was factored into the number of terminals you have. If someone has a computer, in the, if, if everyone in this computer in this building had a computer, you wouldn't need to buy a terminal if that was the case. And I don't know if that was factored in the, the quantity of we electronic looked, time clocks. Yeah, so terminal. when we looked at the quantity of clocks, we, we considered having one in each of the buildings, including here at Town Hall. Okay. It, it, it really, you know, a, the only thing that strikes me weird on this is sixty-seven thousand dollars to implement, but it's twenty-six thousand to maintain it. That's a high price. It's like buy cheap, but I'm going to get you on the annual payment. <laughs> and, and and I know you compared three, so I know this is the best one. It just seems awful expensive, and I don't know why. I you know I personally we've been delaying for a couple of years investing in an updated system at my employer and we've got like two million dollars set aside for upgrading our system and we've got 17,000 employees and it comes out to $111 a year to, for a system that is an ATA system that people swipe under a terminal. This just seems awful high but if it's if it's the going rate and it's what municipality uses it's not much to do but if, if we approve this tonight we're we're adding 20 Five thousand eight hundred dollars to ongoing town budget, and that's going to either have to be paid for by something else, or it's going to cause a little bit of increase to our to our tax rate. And and like you said, Mark, it's kind of tough to prove you're you're getting twenty five thousand dollars back every year of return on the investment. Um, but it's certainly, I know I've done time cards and I've done email and, and scanning and faxing timesheets and it's a joy <laughs> but um so those are my only thoughts and it just seems very expensive for 150 people agreed does the school system use a program yeah, uh, so the, the system I believe that the schools uses, use is Infinite Visions, and, and they use that system because that's the, um, um, uh, I guess, the, the system that they use for all the teachers, so they expanded it to all of their other employees as well. And that's more like an education system. So it couldn't be leveraged or expanded upon for town use? Yeah, I, th I think that has, like, um, what that has wouldn't be um, conducive for our needs. They have their own systems over there, their own. Their own more than their own and I believe there's this pricier, too, isn't it? I'm sure. I think there's a more well, it, it, well, if you if you have to factor in, like, for per employees, th they do have... Um, you know, I think they were like at 500 employees. I mean, but there's just pricier per person than I, I think. Well, if it was similar, I was wondering if you add from 500 to add another 150, it's not that much more. That was kind of my thought, if it was suitable. Mm -hmm. What is the reason for the uh, large annual fee? So they, I think, if you look at the, um, so it's a, um, a tw it's the, it's a hosting fee. Um, 
for 12 months, so it's about $2,100 a month. And then, of course, it's an extra um, three, $350, let's say, for the two months, and then an additional 3400 for um, hard, you know, the hardware and software maintenance. Um, were any other towns who use this system contacted or any on-site observation of well, we 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 did. Um, we had a demonstration. We did a demonstration here with the. Com we did a demonstration with three different companies. Uh, they all similar agree. maintenance fees. Um, yes, for the most part, yes. That's okay. So, are there? Towns that are similar to ours who are using this system, meaning smaller towns as opposed to cities? Um, well, I know Stonington uses this system. They'd be very similar to us. And they're, you know, they're, you know, very similar in size to us. Uh, did anyone go over to talk with them or observe the system? their system to see how it's working? Well, actually, um, Mr. Bergaw speaks very highly of it because when he was in Stonington, they used that system there. Any other questions? In their logo, it says, feel the power. Are you going to feel the power if we get this? <laughs> It'll help out your department. Is that right? It, it's going to help. I think it's going to help everyone, every um, department. Every department. Yeah, it's a Especially tedious task that it's going to eliminate the tedium of, of tracking these. Well, and I, I think it most particularly for um, larger departments with more, more employees, which are uh, yeah. police and the uh, public works department. Sure. So you hear us all choking about the annual, because that is a big burden. I, I, I know we talked about it a long time ago, but I'm, I'm seeing it again for the first time. Um, I, I think I, I will challenge uh, you, the next board, um, I think you'll, you'll, you'll hear this anyway, of trying to find the efficiencies and maybe the savings. Or, or, or it becomes the opportunity to get that floater, floater position that we need so desperately. But, um, but just 20... Five thousand dollars, twenty-six thousand dollars, and and just um, can, you know, hosting fees is just an absurd amount of money. Uh, the system we need, we need we need the electronic system. Uh, it's it's incredible. We have to pay the royalties. Um, um, you can probably not get much for it other than them keeping the software up and running. Uh, but maybe again, with us being more efficient, we can save money either cutting some, some hours back somewhere or being able to apply that to a, a, a better first, a better town hall um, with floater positions or help in the um, finance department. Okay. Uh, in the attached quote, there's a section called third party hardware, software and services. And it says contract total $124,000. Obviously, that's not what we're asking to be approved. Tonight. No, that was... Um, that so, so I, some other options that we decided not to implement. Correct. Okay. No, that's so. One, the first page um, is the Andros Technology Nova Time proposal. That's the one for the sixty-seven. Um, the other hot, larger proposal was the one from um, Munis Tyler Technologies. So um, yeah. Maybe we throw a motion out there, and then, then any further questions I'll or comments? I'll move to approve a special appropriation amount of $67,392 for the purchase, installation, and implementation of the Nova Time, Andrews Technology Time and Attendance System, source of funding being the American Rescue Plan, American Rescue Program funds, and sent to the Board of Finance for approval. Note, a town meeting is required. Second. We have a motion that's been seconded. Are there any further questions or comments? 
Is the whole, I could call it the hosting fee or whatever that we're arguing about, about mm. the ongoing mm. cost, is that, um, is that based on the number of employees? Yes. So we might assume that from year to year that figure might fluctuate? I well the 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 issue is um, when for the um, numbers of employees you're you're purchasing them in increments of fifty, so um, you know we need up to the two hundred and fifty for our regular weekly, and then we need the additional fifty for during for during the summer. And that yearly fee is only locked in for one year. It can go up. It's, you know what, um, that's something I'm going to have to ask that question because I, th I thought that typically your that ma that maintenance fee would remain the same. So it works out to about $166 a year per employee. Well, if there's 250 into 25,000, it's 100. Well, I thought we had 150. We purchase up to 250, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. But so, in addition to the our regular. What is 100 if because we're going to, yeah. yeah, it's a it's a it's a regular. We have like about 125 full-time equivalents, but then we have many part-time firefighters, and we have several part-time dispatchers, and then of course, even in the for the entire year, Parks and Rec has program um, different program um, staff members that we're continually paying. So. Yeah. Mm. Mark, you said you could answer the question on the fee? Of course it's going to go up. No. <laughs> That's all. It's not going to go down. But as we enter the contract, I don't know if it's good for one year, for three years, or I don't, I don't know. Probably year to year, they typically go up, you know, 5% um, with the fees that we pay in the assessor's office and tax office. And all we, all we do is pay all these licenses fees. That's the business to get into. Right, Mike? That's the business, man. You know, all these computer companies and all the software companies. I million dollar deals like this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, uh, did we get a motion on the table? We did. We did. Any Second. further comment? Does that, does that fee include uh, maintenance? I would hope so. Yeah, annual maintenance costs yes, would be 25. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Anything goes wrong, that's part of it. Okay, I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstain? Thank you, Anna. And thank you for having all the answers when we, when well, we asked. Try. <laughs> Appreciate it. The next is to authorize the first selectman um, to uh, enter an agreement with U.S. Bank, the pension payments. Um, Anna, you're staying up there for this one? I will, yes. Yeah, so why don't you guide us through what we're, what we're being asked. So if you recall at the last meeting, um, we talked about uh, the pension committee went out to bid for a new asset manager and, um, y you know, we did, uh, you approved um, executing the contract with that company, Fidition Advisors. As part of the process, we were, um, we also were notified by the, the company that currently processes the retiree monthly retirement um, payments that they will no longer be providing that service as of March 31st, 2022. So we had to find another vendor that would provide that service for us. So um, as part of the RFP process, um, uh, Fidicient um, brought forward um, using U.S. Bank to do that for us. In addition to doing the um, the monthly retirement payments, they were we would we also plan to transfer our um, the assets of the pension plan from Empower Retirement to U.S. Bank. So the agreement is twofold: it's to um, be the custodian of the funds, as as to um, also process our um, the monthly pension <coughs> payments and send out the annual 1099s. So, um, you know, we just kind of want to keep the process moving because, you know, once we get the agreement in place, then the process can start because obviously there is going to be um, a good amount of um, coordination between the current um, company Empower Retirement and U.S. Bank to get this all 
up and running and make it seamless for our retirees that are currently receiving monthly payments. Which is ultimately the goal. So there is a motion that maybe you could that maybe yeah, it better. Oh, and just, I'm sorry, before you say that, I just wanted to mention that we um, had, we did have our attorneys um, review the contract as to form. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I'll move to, what? Thank you. Oh, move to authorize the sitting first selectman of the town of East Lyme to execute on behalf of the town of East Lyme a section 115 custody agreement with U.S. Bank National Association and is authorized to execute any and all documents necessary to consummate the transaction above contemplated. Second. It's motion and second. If you notice, it does say sitting first select. But we, because we're in transition, like literally the next couple of days, we got to be very specific on this motion and therefore the signature on the contract. And and, um, and we that was an issue. So um, you're authorizing me to sign for the U.S. Bank and. I'll tell you what, the pension committee did a stellar job putting this all together. Well, actually, it's like it's so that either you or um, Mr. Siri would be able to sign it. Yeah, oh, we, okay. we just wanted to make sure. We didn't want to um, hold it hold it up. We need to keep this I process it, moving. Because yeah. originally it was like, you got to do it before right. now to yep. make sure I sign it. Okay. Um, thank you for the clarification. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Do you want to sit, stand there and talk about the pension committee experience study as well? I do. <laughs> okay. It's getting so, later and later, so. So. Um, I'm moving us along. The the other item is um, the pension committee um, also contracted the um, actuary that we use for the plan to conduct an an experience study. So this was to look at. Um, what's been going on with the plan. So they looked at both economic and non-economic items. So they looked at, um, in terms of the economic items, it was, you know, what is um, the discount rate um, we're using um, in the valuations, as well as what are we using for projections of employees' um, uh, mm -hmm. annual salary increases. And then um, with regards to... Um, the non-economic assumptions that were reviewed, it was um, the mortality rates, retirement rates, disability rates, and termination rates. So um, the, the, um, the study made um, certain recommendations. For, for example, um, we were using a 7% discount rate. Um, they had recommended that um, we uh, lower it to, I believe, um, 6.75 percent however the committee on this issue um, is recommending that we use 6.5 percent to be um, on the more conservative side and then with regards to salary rates we were using a four a straight four and a half percent and they um, recommended a tiered approach and they did it for um, the like general employees if we if you will um, like from uh, a certain age to a certain age use one um, one increase and then like in later years to use a, a lower increase because what happens if, if you have anyone moving on steps when they get to having a, a longer um, uh, employment with us then their salary increases are, are actually lower and the same for the police and the fire and then it looked at um, the mortality tables and made recommendations rel relative to um, to those as well. And then in terms of retirements, it was basically using the way the plan is set up. Like if you have ten, a minimum of 10 years and when you turn age 65, you retire. Or if you're a police officer, um, you have to have, I believe, you can retire at 50 or 55 if you have 25 years um, of employment with the town. And what was happening is people are actually staying longer. So, um, you know, there were recommendations made to change those assumptions when doing the annual valuations of the plan. Because the annual valuation of the plan tells us what our annual required contribution would be to make sure that we're ad adequately funding it. Um, and so uh, the committee, uh, the pension committee reviewed the report and they recommend that we accept the recommendations as made um, by the actuary with the exception of the one for the um, discount rate to use, actually use 6.5%. And so we're just asking that 
um, you know, the board of the board of fun, the board of selectmen rather, um, excuse me, um, accept um, the uh, the the, the uh, experience study and the recommendations of the pension committee. And so you know, the pension committee is an advisory committee to this board, and they do a stellar job, and they are very thorough. Are there any questions for Anna? Could you put a motion on the I'll table? I'll move to accept the results of the experience study performed for the pension committee and support their recommendations to implement. Second. The motions have been made and seconded. Any questions or concerns? And I'd just like to say thank you for being so thorough in everything you do. Um, and on behalf of this board of selectmen and this first selectmen, uh, couldn't have done it without you. I much appreciate it. Most of what you say goes right over my head because you're so smart at this stuff and, and, and right, I know right. to lean on people who are you know you know what they're talking about and I I fully trust you and in, in, in the work you do with it's done with great integrity and great professionalism thank you well, thank you all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed any abstain okay thank you again Anna. 3D I'm going to put off. Uh, I do believe a, a, a meeting schedule should be voted on by the next board that is actually sitting and agreeing to their meeting schedule. All right. I wanted to add meetings to it. I, exactly. How about if all six of us were leaving? We could make them meet every week. A couple more in the summer. It, doesn't abs it. it absolutely does not make sense. It should be the first biz order of business of the next commission, and they'll still be meeting in this calendar year, and they can set the regular meetings for the next. I, yeah, I, the was, gonna, I was going to abstain if it came up to vote. It, didn't make, it doesn't make any sense. The Board of <laughs> Finance did it. I'm like, why are you voting on this? And well, it came actually, up on we're supposed to have an organizational meeting tonight, too, to appoint, uh, you know, if you like the first meeting in December, is supposed to be for a lot of other things, too, so we can hold off on that. Well, but the way the calendar fell, I mean, I yeah. should be not... Yeah, this is the, one of the only times where, after an election, the sitting first election will be three meetings in yeah. before leaving. So, uh, unfortunately, I'm still here. Uh, ex officio reports, unless you have something uh, uh, urgent that needs to be uh, put on the record of, of all the commissions that you all report to, I'd rather uh, especially hear from Mr. Salerno and Mr. Daigle um, about um, maybe any, any final parting words. This is Salerno, would you? Just real quick. So yeah. library to me, I went there. Um, they're definitely uh, in favor. They voted like uh, t on taking on the museum. The museum idea. Okay, yeah. so they'll be talking, they, they're going to be talking to Kevin about that. Um, and I went to Board of Ed, my last two meetings there. <laughs> um, and the last one was great because Tim, Tim Hagen was honored with oh, yeah. the, the pool being named after him, which uh, came to a complete surprise for him. Other than that, I want to thank everyone. It's been a pleasure serving with everyone here. Um, this has been uh, a great experience. Um, Mark, we've been together for 20 years. Kevin, we've been together, well, between RTC and this for 20-something years. Roseanne was even longer since she was my teacher. Um, Dan, it's been a pleasure. I've learned a lot same from here. you. And uh, Paul, same here. Uh, you brought a lot to this uh, board uh, with your experience and wisdom. So uh, thank you. I'm going to miss you, um, and uh, I won't be a stranger. Me too. Well, this breaks with quite the tradition because this will be the first time in many years that there has not been one of my students sitting on the board. Wow. Oh, man. <laughs> well, at least wow. you'll have parents of some people who <laughs> were your students. So yeah, that, there you go, uh, Mr. Dago. For the first time ever, I'm going to be longer than Mark. <laughs> um, <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mrs. Cheeseman for asking me to, to uh, put myself forward to serve on this board. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, my fellow board members, who voted me onto the board five years ago. Um, then I'd like to thank the Citizens of East Lyme for twice, you know, voting me onto the board. So it, it's it's been an educational, an honor, and a pleasure serving the citizens of East Lyme. I'd also like to thank the department heads for their professionalism and their subject matter expertise. They taught me so much in the last five years that I didn't know. Um, and it, it's just been a very, very valuable experience. And finally, um, I want to thank my fellow Public uh, Safety Vision, Vision Committee members who did a lot of hard work, you know, the questioning attitudes. It was a non 
collab nonpartisan collaboration. It's been a struggle with this building in this town. It's a divided issue. We're, we're almost there, um, but we wouldn't have got this far without the work of the Vision Committee. So I want to thank everyone for their support. And finally, uh, to the f five of you, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been it's been a great experience. Thank you very much. Commissioner, good sitting next to you. You've done you've done very well. Um, Mr. Cunningham, Mr. Siri, Mrs. Mrs. Hardy, anything to throw in? Just uh, I'll just say I've enjoyed working with uh, with this board, and uh, it's been a great pleasure. And, uh, uh, I think we all work together. And, uh, confronted some a lot of a lot of things we had to face with COVID and uh, the public oh. safety building and all the other things and all the all the you know, I was reading the list of things that you accomplished during your administration. It's quite impressive and. Uh, Glad to be a part of it. So. Yeah, it, it 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 becomes nostalgic at a time like this. Uh, um, you know, I'm knowing. Uh, you know, I, it started with me, uh, Esther. I think Esther Williams. I think in 1994, when I was a resident of Trooper she goes, "I got to get you involved." And I said, "No, nah, maybe just on a minor level." But uh, I've gotten to meet and work with some fantastic people. I uh, the thoroughness, Mark, of you, you know, bringing to. The, you know the the tedious things that have to be brought out. You've always done, and I mean that in a really positive sense. We've had better results from what we've enacted because of your thoroughness, and I I appreciate that, uh, Paul. Uh, you know I think back to youth football, with uh, you as coach and t talking to my son when he was thinking of taking a year off from football. You and Gary White talking to him and in, in, in a very great way to keep them active and involved and so forth like that um, and obviously the friendship Kevin and Brian shared uh, it's going to be uh, I'll miss you a great deal and I hope to still see you at a lot of events so and Mark it has been a total pleasure I mean it's this is uh, I and mean, I guess yeah, I'm trying to think of some words to describe uh, the, the very positive uh, encounter with you I mean uh, we've Watch football games together. I remember coming over to your house for a Super Bowl when the power went out at the uh, the San Francisco Baltimore game. Yeah, and that and just a lot of things and just um, I think we've shared a lot of uh, uh, discussions over the last several years, and I think uh, you've brought out the best of me and I appreciate all you've done. So thank you. It's a nice, nice compliment. Thank you, Mrs. Hardy. I think it's all been said. Uh, you know, I'm going to regret not writing some of this down, that all the things I want to say, and I won't say. Uh, I'm just going to say it's been an absolute pleasure working with you all. Uh, this is just an incredibly great board who, you know, we put the politics aside and we all, we don't agree all the time, but boy, do we get the, we make the right decision and, and, and we have great discussions uh, here and bumping into each other uh, along the way. I, you mentioned the list of accomplishments. I accomplished nothing alone. Everything was a collaboration. That's what I learned about this job. It's about collaboration. It's about everything I do is about working with someone else to get someone to do something or work with me to help. You know, Paul, you, we learned that at the vision committee. That building didn't get done by one person, or period. I mean, your vision committee was outstanding. I learned how it can, I, I had the unique position and you will too, and Mrs. Hardy did, um, of, 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 of being the chief elected official and watching a, how a community works. It's like opening up the back of a watch and watching all the gears, and this one's going this way. And, the, and it's amazing when I step back, and I'm starting to, in my mind, already step back, and just think about how this community works. And this is a successful community. And how this affects this but goes through all these different, it's, I was having this discussion with Father Tony down at St. John's this Sunday about, uh, about, about how the church is so important in our community. But this one is too, and this one, and the, the Shoreline Food, and the, the Karen Share, and, and all these people that volunteer, all these people that come out and make comments for us to consider the other side of the, uh, of the conversation. It's amazing to watch this community from the vantage point, and I'm just the luckiest guy in the world 
to have had the opportunity to do it. I thank the, the citizens of our, of our town for giving me that opportunity for 22 years, watching how zoning works, watching how selectment works. I, for the great mentors, and everybody's been, you take something from everyone, and everyone makes you better. And we all make the town better. So thank you for the opportunity of uh, your, your professional working with you, but also your friendship. Um, it means a lot, and uh, um, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. I, I can't say more than that, so thank you. There's, um, there's two people in the audience. Is there any uh, um, public comment this evening? You're, Mike, you're not a man of many words sometimes, and we'll leave it there. Um, so if there's no other response, we'll go into executive session. Good God, you want my last meeting to be really long, don't you? <laughs> um, we'll go into executive session um, to, to discuss personnel issues um, and with human resources, if you will. Okay. And Sandy, you can um, we can catch you up tomorrow, so I can let you go home to your family and. Okay. So moved. Let her get the motion. Yeah. Can, and second. And second, and we're going to go into executive session. It's not going to take very long. Can there a Siri? Yeah. Mr. Deputy, deputy for selectman? Yes, I'll move to appoint <laughs> Tracy Santos as the Human Resources Director and uh, move to approve a special appropriation and transfer the amount of $4,164 from account number 01-01-120-200-500 contingency to account number 01-01-106-100-211, HR manager, and forward to the Board of Finance for approval. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. That should be your final motion. Do you have someone doing all that work for you now? Mm. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? You want to make, make, make one final motion? I will move to adjourn. I will second that. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, thank you all.